Hi, good morning everyone. We're just going to start. There are two people not here, but they are in the building, so I'm sure they'll join us in a moment. Can I welcome everyone to the Environment and Infrastructure meeting this morning? Um, can I just point out there's, we're not expecting a fire drill, so if the fire alarm goes off, I think we can assume it's real. And uh, elected members and staff should make their way to their usual area. Council officers will deal with the uh, members of the press and the public and get them to safety. Can I ask if all mobile phones should be switched off? And if you're using communications devices for the purposes of the meeting, can you make sure they're on silent mode? Do we have any apologies for today's meeting? We have, <coughs> excuse me, we have apologies for Council, Councillor Banacle, who's been substituted by Councillor McDade. Apologies for Councillor McCall, who's been substituted by Chris Ahern. Apologies from Councillor Purvis, who's been substituted by Councillor Illingworth. Okay. And that's it. Thank you. Do we have any declarations of interest for today's business? take that as a no then. Okay, we have a request for a deputation. In uh, terms of standing order 72, the committee is asked to consider a request for a deputation from Neil Coombe, Creethbid, Rural Events for the application. Can I have the committee's agreement that Neil Coombe be allowed to address the committee? Thank you. Can I, fur can I have the committee's further agreement to vary the order of business so we, near, so we hear Neil Coombe before item four? Why wouldn't we just hear it before item five, convener? Sorry, say that again, Councillor. Why wouldn't we just hear it before item five? Yeah, I'm comfortable with that. Let's just do that. Okay, next up. Um, it was agreed at the last meeting that we have a report on the conditions of the roads in Perth and Kinross Council to be brought to this committee. Council officers have prepared a short presentation on the subject. Can I have the committee's agreement to do this now? Thank you. Stuart Vial, I believe, is ready and waiting. Over to you, Stuart. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, this is just a short presentation to, to let you know where we are in terms of pothole repairs um, and the, the condition of the network and um, where we're going in terms of the, the repairs to the network through the, the course of the, 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 this financial year. Um, as everyone's aware, it's not a specific PKC issue. Uh, the freeze, thaw, winter weather series damage the network across the country and it will take a little time to recover um, in terms of um, structural repairs to the network. The trunk road network was similarly deteriorated despite significant higher um, levels of investment in its maintenance compared to local roads. So it's not, it's not um, peculiar either to council roads or to um, Perth and Kinross council roads alone. Um, in terms of performance last year, um, these are the stats um, out of, of our system. Um, our category one repairs um, met the 100% target with 53 throughout the year. Um, category 2 um, repairs, our target again is 100% and we didn't achieve that, that level, we got 89% within the 24 hours. And our category 3 repairs is 74%, is an 84% target. Um, as you can see, 9,645 repairs were repaired, 74% of these within the target of 7 days. The, the, the combination of providing the, the winter service and the large number of defects meant that um, we didn't manage to achieve all the PIs that we set for ourselves each year. Um, there were 652 defects that were notified to us through our system that were inspected but didn't constitute a hazard. And uh, our supervisors obviously inspected them to make sure they didn't constitute a hazard. And of the total defects for the year, just under 5,000 were um, between January and March of, of the year, which is the same period, we're, as I say, we're carrying out the winter service. So it was a significant challenge to um, repair them all. Despite the better weather since um, the start of April, we we'll have repaired um, 1,481 defects on the network since the 1st of April. Um, there's a number 
also repaired that we're just waiting the paperwork to catch to catch up on. That's just a, a graphic presentation of where the, the potholes come in. You can see from hopefully you can see from the, the orange number, which is the fairly steep num um uh, one. Let's see if I can get it in. Like this. That, that's 2015-16, and that was immediately after the the events of Storm Frank and Storm Desmond. And you can see there's a large spike in pothole numbers. Um, this year, this year is, uh, pardon me. Here's um, that's the year just past the uh, 2018, um, and that's um, as a direct result of the winter weather that we suffered with the freeze thaw. The green line just below that is um, that was last year, and as you can see, it was a fairly benign period of weather we had in that period. And there's a direct correlation between the number of potholes we're getting in the benign period, the winter, and obviously the, the really wet, stormy weather. Just to put it in a bit of context, um, and I've anonymised these authorities just in case they haven't reported anything to committee. But this was a snapshot that we took through SCOTS, which is the Society, Society for Chief Officers for Transportation in Scotland. Uh, we took this snapshot the week commencing the 5th of March, um, but it is an indication of, of where, where we are. Um, as you can see, there was a large, a large increase in, in potholes across um, all the authorities that we were, managed, we were managed to speak to, and also an indication that there was going to be significant repair costs through this coming financial year as a result of the, the weather we had. Um, for the same period, perfectly honest figures which aren't on there, we, were, we had an increase in 28% in terms of pothole damage um, on uh, the previous year. Um, although we're still significantly below the Storm Desmond and Storm Frank, Frank years. We are um, still carrying out temporary repairs. Um, we don't want to be doing repairs when they're, obviously when they're, they're full of water, as, as indicated in the top right there. But on occasions, we do have to do repairs in these situations. We won't use, although we're using, um, I'm going to use the term tar, which is a fairly generic term, but we are using tar for the majority of our repairs um, in situations where the hole's full of water and it's presenting a significant hazard, we will use a proprietary material that's designed to work in these situations. So there are cir circumstances where we're, we're using that proprietary material. Similarly, we'll use it for an urgent defect, defect where we can't get to a quarry to get tar or where the, the traffic movements in relation to the pothole make it unsafe um, to do it with tar until a suitable traffic management system is put in place. But we are um, doing the majority of our, our um, repairs in, in tar. Um, there are also scenarios there. You see the bottom, the, the picture to the left, the left in the bottom picture. They're repairs in tar, but they're not first time permanents. And there will be a number of instances on the network where we will do repairs like that. And we won't do a first time permanent by cutting the, the, the joint, uh, cutting the edges, painting joints and, and, and compacting it with an um, appropriate plant because the rest of the road round about it's deteriorated significantly, and so it would be a waste of resources uh, spending the time and the money doing a first time permit in that situation where we've got to come back and do a repair that's significantly larger than that. Um, so these sort of repairs will continue to be done with pulp material so that they stay in, but we will follow up with a, a, a programme of structural patching um, throughout the course of the year to repair the overall damaged area of the road. We are doing first time permanents, and um, you can see the cut joints on the, the, the left hand photograph. We've cut vertical joints, we've tied it in the gully, and we've put in the, the appropriate material and we're, we're compacting it. So there are a number of situations where we're doing that. And we reckon there's about, we're, we're doing in the region of 88% uh, first time permanents at this moment in time, using the same level of plant we've been using since um, late March, early, uh, late February, early March. We've got five two man crews using the hot material on the network, and we've got three five-man crews using the hot material on the network as well. The, again, these are first-time permanent repairs. Um, you can see again on the left-hand photographs, we've cut the joint, um, we've painted the joint, and we've, we've reinstated it. The, the patches on the right-hand side, the reinstatements on the right-hand side are also first-time permanents. They've not been squared off in plan, but they have been squared off vertically, the joints painted, and the material um, laid and compacted. So we are squaring the edges on a lot of these reinstatements where it perhaps doesn't look like a squared patch on the surface. Um, 
We've got additional funding from Scottish Government to help deal with the damage that, uh, that the network suffered last year. Um, £365,000 been allocated to um, Perth and North Council. That's that would achieve around 3,200 first-time repairs and plus 1,500 temporary repairs because, as I've said, we can't do all of them um, in the first time of asking. So that's the sort of level of repairs, uh, pothole repairs, we could achieve from that additional Scottish Government funding. In terms of resurfacing, um, averaging out at a five and a half metre wide road, um, that would, in, in a hot rolled asphalt um, material, that would give us roughly two miles a network that we could resurface for that money. In addition to the potholes we're doing, we've got uh, our road maintenance projects have all been identified, and that's the level of investment we're putting into various different um, treatments. Surface dressing, our, our programme started now. Um, we're spending roughly one and a half million pounds on surface dressing across 46 projects across the whole of the council area. Surface dressing is where we put down a, a layer of bitumen, spray chips on the top of it, compact it, and then op open the road. And that, that effectively seals the road with the intention of preventing the formation of potholes, um, preventing the formation of potholes on the network. We are doing roughly 36 resurfacing projects at a cost of 2.8 million. Um, structural reinstatements, and that relates back to where, where I indicated that we'll continue to do repairs with hot material, that we're not cutting the joints because we've got to do a, a bigger area. We spend roughly 2.3 million pounds on re structural reinstatements, and that's across 68 projects we've identified in the council area to do that. Um, our footway surface, and there's roughly 17 projects included in that, and we're slurry sealing um, 42 projects we've identified. Although we do have an issue with the mix for our slurry sealing at the moment that we've got, um, our supplier back in looking at the, the, the composition of the mix, so we've suspended that for, for a week or two till we get to the bottom of that. Um, we've met with uh, our Ward 8 councillors to go over the, the schemes that we're doing, and we're aiming to set up meetings with uh, all the other wards as well as the action partnerships to discuss the proposals that we've got um, for this year. And all of the work included in this, this slide, the value work and the number of projects I've mentioned, are designed, procured and supervised by um, council staff, either within the road maintenance partnership or within the design team that um, is under Chick Haggard's leadership. And that's a snapshot of where we are in terms of the road network at this time. Thank you, Stuart. Happy to take a few, or Stuart, hopefully yeah. we'll be happy to take a few questions. Yeah. I won't be taking any questions on <laughs> <laughs> road maintenance, so if anyone has any questions for Stuart. Councillor Ling. Uh, the first question is for you, convener, um, because I was sent to the committee when the new policy on potholes uh, was adopted. Uh, I was just wondering, and I, I seem to remember that we weren't going to be doing temporary repairs. Councillor Robertson was very uh, forceful in his... Uh, uh, views that we shouldn't be doing temporary repairs for the people of Perth and King Ross, and that every repair would be cut first time and sealed. So I was just wondering how we're performing to the policy that you int your uh, administration introduced. I think I'll maybe leave Stuart one yeah. to answer that one. It was never the intention that every single pothole would always receive a first time permanent repair. That that's not that's not in the policy. So. What were we go we were going to stop using? What was the policy then? Refresh me. I read it myself. We've, we've extended the period of time to effect repairs to give us the opportunity to, to do more first-time permanent repairs, but we'll never achieve 100% first-time permanent repairs. Um, one, because uh, weather conditions and at times we've got to effect repairs means we can't do a first-time permanent because we use material called, it's a proprietary material called Viafix, and that's not a permanent um, cut joint first-time repair. We've also got periods where we will get potholes will be become apparent where we can't get to the quarry to get material to do a first time permanent repair and there are other situations where the position or the location of the, of the pothole within the network will require significant traffic management to be set up to affect a permanent repair so it was never the intention to do 100% we, were, we reckoned 80% was, was a, a figure where we would look to achieve first time permanent Okay I'll accept that it was possibly just the misleading way it was put forward um, do you think that um, because of the way the policy was put forward that people were having more potholes reported uh, now than we did before? I can never remember having a mailbag uh, back. I've been councillor officer now for six years. 
back in the last uh, Storm Desmond, I think you called it, I can't remember so many people contacting me about potholes. And I can't remember an area, I had a 1.2 mile area in my ward which had 51 defects in it, which seems a horrendous number. And they were uh, temporary repairs, which cost us, I think, estimated about 1,400 pounds. Um, I, I, don't, I don't understand why we, why the roads apparently, is it just apparently and people are just imagining that they're a lot worse now than they've ever been? I think, I think the stats demonstrated that the, the roads haven't got as many potholes on them as they did immediately following Storm Frank and Desmond. I think the council have uh, taken strides to encourage the public to report them um, more frequently. And I, I don't know if that, that's bear, bearing fruit um, in terms of the numbers we're getting reported. Um, but the, the condition, we are also there's a, a Scottish road maintenance condition survey that gets carried out annually. Um, so they're currently in Perth and Canals doing that survey. So when we'll be able to tell better once these results come out, we'll get a comparison on the condition of our network now compared to last year, compared to the Storm Desmond Frank year, and compared to something like seven or eight years previous to this. So we can get a statistical, statistical um, evidence of what the road condition is like. Thank you. Um, in the the budget that was passed, uh, the revenue budget, we, we've taken. We're not going to be putting uh, any extra money into the capital budget for next year for roads maintenance. Is that correct? Will that not have a detrimental effect on our capacity to uh, to uh, affect road repairs? Any reduction in budget on the road uh, that we've got for road repairs will have a, a detrimental effect on the network. Um, I think this is the final year of the, the three-year um, additional money that was put in, and I don't know. I don't know the position um, on, on future years. There is no nothing put in for future years. Thank you, Councillor Link. Councillor Ahern was next. Thank you very much, Convener. Stuart, in your um, presentation, you mentioned the 365,000 extra money for the Feast of the East. Did we get similar funding for Desmond and Frank? Uh, and if not, what's the difference from? funding we got from the Scottish Government there because we actually managed to do quite a, can get a quite a lot of work done from that extra 365,000. Yeah. I'm sure we did get additional money following Storm Desmond and Frank but I can't remember the exact, what the exact figures were. Did we, we put in a Berlin claim for, for that because there was significant damage? If, if I could come in on that, yes, we did get, you know, sort of um, Berlin money which is, you know, sort of part of the, the, the Scottish Government's emergency response, you know, sort of, but that covered a number of events. You know, it covered, you know, sort of Aylith flooding, you know, sort of, which had happened in the, the summer before Storms Desmond and Frank. Um, there was additional money, you know, sort of, that was provided to some local authorities because of the impact specifically of, of Desmond and Frank, but we also got a contribution to um, Bleaton Hallett Bridge as well, which had collapsed during one of the, 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 the storm events of that year. So there was quite a significant amount of money, but it was for separate weather, weather events, um, mostly caused by, um, you know, sort of water. And at this point, you know, sort of there is some significant, you know, sort of issues round about what Stuart's talking about, about freeze thaw, um, which has had a different impact on, on, the, on, on the network than just a lot of rain, which is what Desmond and Frank were. Thank you. I think next up was uh, Councillor Jarvis. Yes. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, you talked about the consultations with members and the action partnership. Do you actually include the community councils? Because when I go to community councils and mention road works that are about to happen, often they just seem unaware of them. Mm. And it would be a good conduit of getting the message out to, you know, the communities if the community councils are involved. We, we don't consult the community councils about our initial plans for the year, for the programme for the year. Um, when we do do significant uh, works with the significant closures, we do go through a stakeholder consultation, um, but we don't meet with the community councils regarding every piece of work that we're going to be undertaking, no. Um, it all comes into a, a resource issue, really, in terms of when we c how many people we can go out and, and meet with. I, well, I wasn't even specifically meaning that, you know, a meeting with them, but just an email, for example, right. just to say that this work will be done and if possible to give them some sort of time scale so that they're aware of what's going on. Yeah. What I could do is, um, you'll all have seen the emails that come out from our network management team who promote closures. I could speak to the network management team and see if there's, if there's any way just to include 
community councils on on that um, email distribution. I don't know if they're currently on it, um, but I could I could I could double check. The, the downside is that, and it's probably the same with, with uh, elected members. I think all elected members get notification of all road closures, even if they're in your ward or not. So it would probably be set up so that all community councils would get notification of all road closures, whether they were in their, their, their community or not. So that might be a, a downside. But I could certainly double check. Yeah, but the other, you know, sort of where there will be significant, you know, sort of a road closure, you know, sort of you would go out and specifically speak to community councils about that, where, you know, sort of there might be, you know, sort of big diversions and things like that. So, you know, sort of for normal ones, probably, you know, sort of not, but for sp very specific ones, then yes. Thank you. Councillor Robertson was next, followed by Councillor Waters, I think, after that. Thank you, Convener. Um, have you, has your team noticed a, an improvement in the, the feedback you've been getting now that you're doing more permanent repairs? I, I personally have had a lot of people saying to me that they notice that the repair is not just a dodded tire and a hole. Have you had actually more feedback yourself that it's they're no, happier with it? I've not, there's not been a great deal of feedback coming back into us at, at officer level in, in relation to the, the different type of repair we're doing. Okay, can um, I just can I make a few comments as well when I'm on my feet. Um, two things, um, I, on two occasions recently I cycled part of the route that the tap took. First time I cycled it there was quite a few road defects I noticed mm -hmm. and I said to myself that is never going to be sorted in time for last weekend and I cycled this part of the route on Friday and all the defects had been sorted so I yeah. thought that was remarkable. And also can I say that um, our road n network is, 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 a, is difficult but if you actually look at the trunk road network, the condition that some of the trunk roads are in Scotland, especially the road to Oban I drove not long ago, was appalling. So we do a pretty good job of given the circumstances. Thanks very much. Thank you for that. Uh, we're going to go um, Councillor Waters, Councillor Baird, Councillor McDade and Councillor Williamson. And if everyone's in agreement, I think we'll move on because it wasn't really a paper, it was just a presentation. So Councillor Waters. Thank you, Convener. Just carrying on from Councillor Lane's uh, comment, can I ask you just how close we are to achieving the 80% the um, of first-time fixes? Anecdotally, we reckon we're in about the, the, the between 75 and 80% in terms of the first-time fixes, but that's anecdotal. Um, yeah. The paperwork takes a wee while to catch up because it's the same guys that pick up the defect, uh, that put the line out to get it fixed, that monitor it getting fixed and then close it all off again. And uh, because we've got this longer period to affect the repair, we've also got a longer period of, period of closing them off. So we won't know until we're maybe a couple of months in the sort of stats we're getting in terms of the first time repairs. But anecdotally, I reckon it's about 75 to 80. Yeah. And we're not having to go back to many to do um, any yeah. repeat repairs. Can I just ask over what period that is? That's since first of April. Since first of April. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Waters. Councillor Baird, please. Thank you, Convener. Um, my question is slightly different. I'm going to talk about gully boxes and block. <laughs> Stuart just loves when I talk about gully boxes. <laughs> I, I drive around the countryside quite a bit and I keep seeing these gully boxes that are really full. And if these gully boxes were emptied, it probably would prevent some of these potholes because some of the roads flooded. And one of the, I don't want to start talking about local roads, but there is one that I drive regularly and it is continually flooded and I know the gully boxes are full because I've got out of the car, they've looked. So I know we only get get done once a year if they're blocked, but I think maybe if they were done more regularly, we might have less potholes. So sometimes it's a spend to see if they... Yes. We, we did reduce our gully cleanse and frequency to once per annum, but if there are any that are blocked that are causing a hazard to the road network, we will go out and cleanse them reactively. And we've got a new system where we're recording how um, the, con the condition of gullies when we get to them, the condition of when we've left them, and how often we have to go to react as a reactive response in an effort to, in future years, to target these ones that need the reactive response more frequently at the expense of others that perhaps don't need an annual cleanse. Thank you, Councillor Baird. Uh, Councillor Williamson, and then finishing up with Councillor McDade. Thank you, Convener. I was, I was just uh, I quite welcome the idea that you are going to go out to the Action Partnerships and try and speak to the community, but I just feel slightly you're running a little bit behind the curve. Is that correct? That I think it would have been better if people would have been aware of 
when the closures are taking place in the forthcoming year rather than retrospectively. Thank you, Councillor Williamson. Was that a comment or a question? Okay. Uh, it's a fair comment. It all comes down to resources. Again, the guys that are, that are managing the winter service delivery that we've got, um, winter ran on longer this year, so we had less time to prepare this, the scheme list, so they were sli done slightly later. Um, and, as, and then we've got to identify officers to go out and meet all the different wards. So, so it does take a little bit of time, and it's purely down to resources. But yeah, ideally, we'd like to be out meeting the elected members and the action partnerships in February to say this is our proposal for next year, and it's something we'll aim to do for next year. Um, and time will tell whether the weather conditions and the resources will allow us to do that. Last but definitely not least, Councillor McDade. Thank you, uh, convener. Uh, just a couple of uh, quite small questions. I welcome the uh, coming out in February. I think that will be very positive, particularly on those of us who have <laughs> wards with <laughs> major road closures <laughs> coming up. Um, and uh, my question is around, following up on Councillor Baird's point, actually, around uh, a lot of the rural roads do suffer because obviously it's quite difficult to put drainage in, etc. And whether we could perhaps put more camber on some of these roads to let the water drain off it faster, because um, apart from at a tap time, the rural roads in Highland Perthshire tend to be pretty damn bad, um, and it would perhaps help alleviate that situation and reduce the need for pothole repairs. Yep. Uh, Any time we're doing resurfacing, we obviously look at the, the profile of the road, um, and we'll look to either put cross fall on, which takes all the water to one side, depending on where it is, and if you're going around a bend, because you don't want to put camber on to throw you off the wrong side of a bend, so we will look to put cross fall on or camber whenever it's appropriate to do it, yeah. And we've also, we've, there's things called, some folk call them grips, we call them off wits, but I've just cut channels in the, in the, in the verges. You we go around and we repeat, uh, cut these, but again, overrun the traffic, passing each other, very often fills these in, which leads to the, the water still lying on the, the road surface. Councillor Robson, I did I, I see last question. It would be useful if all councillors could get a copy of Mr. Dole's presentation. I would like that. Are you happy with that? Yeah, no, well, yeah. Will you I arrange for that to happen? Arrange that to happen, yeah, no problem. All councillors or just the councillors in? Okay. Are you yeah, okay with can that? Do that? Yeah, I can do that. No okay, problem. we'll organise that thing. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to item four, which are the minutes of the previous meeting. And I have an apology uh, in his absence to Councillor Barnacle. Um, We've referred to him as D Barnacle when it should have said M Barnacle, so I apologise to him for that. I have already done so. Can we agree the minute of the meeting of the 21st of March? Yeah, it's just a question, uh, convener. In your absence at the last uh, 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 the last meeting of the e and I committee on the Winter Festival, your uh, your leader was substituting for you, and, and uh, I raised the point that um, it was strange that we're closing the toilets in Perth all the public toilets in Perth, at the same time as we're attracting people in the Winter Festival. He intimated it was a good point well made and he'd be discussing it with you as a matter of urgency, so I was wondering where we were with We did indeed discuss that, and I think if I recall correctly, the council bring in a huge number of toilets for these events anyway, far more than are currently existing in Perth. Am I right in saying that, Barbara? That was the... So we'll, the toilets will still be closed? Indeed, yes. But we'll have... Uh, Throughout the winter period, we will be buying in por portaloos and, and paying for them. No, I think for specific events, the council bring in portaloos. Is that right, Barbara? I'll let Barbara answer that. Thank you. The council already, we have a stock of our own um, portable toilets, you know, sort of, um, and the, the number of comfort schemes that already exist around specific events as well. Uh, do you have a cost for uh, deploying these compared with the cost of having the toilet open uh, through the winter period? I don't know off the top of my head, but we'll be able to provide that for you. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Lane. So, back to the minutes. Do I have the approval to sign off the minute from the previous meeting? Agreed. Okay, moving on to item five. Perth and Kinross currently applies charges for the internment and cremation of children and young people from the age of 2 to 15 years. In order to ensure that the Council's support for children, young people and families provides the most sympathetic approach, 
It has proposed that fees for burials and cremations for children and young people under 18 years of age should be waived. The committee is asked to agree the above proposal and to authorise the Executive Director to make these changes to the Housing and Environment Service scheme of charges. This is intended to support families at an extremely difficult time in their lives and will be implemented with immediate effect. If the committee approves this, I have asked for this change as I believe it is the right thing to do. Can the committee agree to the proposals and to authorise the Executive Director to make these changes to the Housing Environment Service scheme of charges? I think Councillor Bailey was first, followed by Councillor Dugan, followed by Councillor Clark. Thank you, Karina. So um, this is a great initiative and one that has my full support. It's fantastic we're able to do this. However, I note that usually when items like this come to committee or full council, they contain a costing. Do we have an idea of um, what this will cost council um, in future years or what it would have done if we'd done it for the last financial year, for example? Barbara, can you take that? Okay, thank you for the question, Councillor Bailey. Um, thankfully, it is quite a small number, which obviously reflect, reflects, you know, sort of a very few number of families that are affected this way. So it's approximately a thousand pounds a year. Thank you, Councillor Dugan. Uh, thank you, Convener. I share uh, Councillor Bailey's enthusiasm for this. I'm very grateful that you've brought it forward to the committee. I think it's entirely the right thing to do. I would only ask, Convener, if we could possibly look subject to a very good reason otherwise to making it 21 rather than 18. I know we've got to draw the line somewhere, but I think uh, contemporary society, uh, many uh, young people up to the age of 21 and beyond, but many people up to the age of 21 are still living at home, they're still essentially in that child space uh, as young adults, and I think um, it would be a it, it would be a, a more appropriate cut-off. I can understand why it's 18 in legal terms, but in real terms, in real lives, I think 21 might be um, more suitable. And as the Executive Director says, thankfully we're talking about very small numbers. What we'll do, Councillor Dugan, is we'll look at the implications of that and we'll bring that back again, if that's OK with you. Can I ask you for a specific time that you'll bring that back, Convener? Thank you. What, what I possibly suggest is that, you know, sort of within, you know, sort of I have um, delegated authority for quite a substantial amount of money, but I think if it was something round about the same region between the, the 1,000, 2,000 pounds, if the committee had agreed that it's not going to be any more than that, that we would then just change it to 21. The committee would agree that today, subject to it being any more than that. Would that be all right? Are you comfortable with that, Councillor Dugan? Well, I think I'm convener. So the, the Executive Director is saying that the, we'll, we'll agree as a committee today mm -hmm. that it's 21 subject to the Executive Director's clarification on the cost yes. that's within your yes. authority. Yes. Okay, thank you. Happy thank you. Councillor Parrott. Thank you, convener. I, I, I too heartily welcome this proposal. Um, the, the paper doesn't mention the charging regime presently for 16 and 17 year olds. Presumably, um, since they will in future be free, they, they were charged, but was that at an adult rate previously as opposed to a child rate for two to 15 year olds? Barbara Bailey, can you answer? I think Bruce is free to answer. Yeah, yeah. So just for clarification, we're, we're getting rid of the child rate completely, but, but 16 and 17 year olds who previously would have been charged at an adult rate, that is also being waived. Yeah, okay, thanks. Actually up to 21. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. <coughs> Councillor Ahern. Thank you, Convener. I'd just like to uh, second Councillor Dugan's proposal to bring it up to 21 um, based on the difference in the, the, the charges. Thank you. Do we have any further questions? Okay, I'm happy to move this. Do we have any comments? And we're all agreed, subject to the, the discussions we've had today. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on to deputation from Mr. Coombe. I understand that's the correct pronunciation from Creethbid. Thank you, Mr. Coombe. Is around about five minutes okay for you? Excellent. And are you okay if we open up to questions afterwards?
Well, good morning, everybody, and thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today about our application to the uh, Rural Events Fund. It's been quite a long, tortuous path to get to here, and what I'd like to do, hopefully the paper itself gives you enough detail to give you a flavour of the event, which should give you a brief summary of uh, BID, the activities in Crete, and where we've got to in terms of our own events strategy. So my name is uh, Neil Coombe. I'm the manager of CREEF BID Succeeds Limited, um, which delivers the business plan on behalf of the BID in CREEF. For those of you not familiar with a BID, a BID is a business improvement district. Um, it first emanated from Canada. And essentially it's a vehicle for a community, normally a business community, to drive forward plans to regenerate an area. The CREEF bid was established in 2015 uh, after a ballot of 300 businesses. 70% uh, majority of a 60% turnout voted in favour of the bid based on a five-year plan which contained a number of different elements, all designed to grow, um, or aim towards sustainable growth based on the tourism and uh, events-based strategy. Now, it's fair to say that um, two and a half years in, we've had reasonable success uh, and certainly in terms of events, which is an item in the business plan, we've had some success in uh, investing in local community um, events. The problem that we've seen is that these events have a, a local appeal and our, our main focus, if you like, is to drive footfalls and visitation uh, into Creef and the surrounding areas. And we believe that for the local events, um, well produced and well delivered, successful they are, don't have the wide appeal that drives a footfall into the town and therefore to the benefit of the businesses. What we know, and you've probably read all sorts of uh, reports over the last uh, few months, uh, businesses, uh, certainly in the high street, are closing at a rate of around about five a week. But those businesses themselves are being replaced, but there's still a gap between um, the businesses that close and the businesses that open. And the businesses that open in general are more specialists, they're cafes, restaurants, and so on, but they in themselves are not enough to, to turn back the trajectory of internet shopping. What we do know, and looking at Perth as a perfect example of that, is that by offering um, strong cultural events and entertainment, it will drive footfall back into the town. And it's on that premise that we want to establish uh, flagship uh, production, which is the um, subjects of the paper that you have um, today to consider which will deliver in and around 7,500 visitors into the town. We've engaged with uh, a very professional company who have experience, wide experience in delivering the events in terms of Enchanted Forest, uh, Spirits of Schoon, Colours of Cluny, and we've chosen Drummond Gardens as a venue um, for that production. The beauty of Drummond Gardens is that it it's, um, encapsulates everything that we require in a venue. People will need a ticket to get into the venue. They will need to get on a coach. They drive to the venue, and that coach will leave from Creef. And it really um, delivers uh, our main aim, if you like, which is to drive football into the centre of town. And the benefits from that uh, will emanate from that presence. The production will be of a theatrical nature, involving actors, light projection, sound, and we'll use the uh, surrounding areas of the castle in its first year. In the second and subsequent years, we're looking for what they call additionality, and we'll extend the production into the gardens so it becomes a, a bigger event. The theme will be uh, festive. We're using a uh, work entitled um, Horrible Histories, which I know you'll be familiar with from the television programme. And it will involve businesses um, in a market at Drummond Gardens itself, and involve businesses in the town to take advantage of the increased footfall. That really is, uh, in a nutshell, um, the event. Um, in terms of the bid, we believe it's the way forward, and borrowing from the experience of Enchanted Forest to the north of Perth, the events in Perth itself, in terms of the Greatest Weekend, and the Perth Arts Festival, the salute to the city, uh, we believe it's central to our um, business plans going forward to deliver the increased footfall um, from wider Persia that we're looking for. So thank you very much for your attention and happy to take questions. Thank you, Mr. Coombe. Can I ask if there's any questions for Mr. Coombe? And I think we'll then take questions on the report separately to that. 
So we're going to go with uh, Councillor Donald. Thank you. First of all, uh, I'd like to thank Neil Kim for his presentation. Um, this is an event I'd like to see proceed, but uh, I think it brings benefits not just to Creef if it's done well and the operational plans are up and running, but also to West Perthshire and emulating the success of the Enchanted Forest. But can I just ask Neil Kim? The working title is Horrible Histories, and obviously I think it's Jacobite theme, probably Rob Roy, but are there any copyright problems on that front, or are you looking at something similar to Horrible Histories, but not, not quite identical? And also, just with the concept, with those who go and taken by bus from Creve out and then brought back, what exactly will they experience o over the period that you know, they're at Drummond Castle? Um, there's good questions here, or questions. Um, first of all, the working title, Horrible Histories, is exactly that. It's a working title that we can just hang our hat on, if you like, so that when it, within the bids and our production team, we know exactly what we're talking about. Um, the title is copyright, it's a BBC um, television production, and the name will change. In terms of the detail, whether it's Jacobites, whether it's Outlander, um, it will uh, lean very heavily on historical figures. There'll be humour, very much like Spirits of Schoon. There'll be a festive element based on the fact we aim to deliver the events last weekend in November, first weekend um, in December. And in terms of the experience, the experience starts as soon as people come into the town. So there'll be some form of entertainment uh, pertinent to the events at Drummond Gardens in the square maybe a treasure hunt, some of the finer detail hasn't been worked through. But what we're conscious of the fact is that there's a 15 minute coach journey from the centre of Creef out to Drummond Gardens. And in that 15 minutes, we have a chance to engage uh, with the, the passengers on those vehicles to make sure that by the time they get to uh, Drummond Gardens, they're aware of what it is, the experience they like to enjoy when they get there. So hopefully Stuart, that's answered the questions. Just to uh, follow up on that. So what you're saying is this is not just about people going to Drummond Castle, Drummond Gardens for the event. It's a flow-through uh, experience from the town itself out and then back again. Yes, absolutely. Because I, I don't think that probably comes through clearly enough in, in, in the paper. And I think it's an important point to get over. And so it's going to encourage... Uh, those that come from Glasgow, Edinburgh, and also locally, but to stay in the town and to, to use local shops as well. Yes, yeah, so that's, that's one of the benefits of um, having the, the coaches actually leave from James Square to Central Point. Uh, in a way, we're actually forcing people to come into the town. We looked at a number of different venues actually in Creef itself, and the disadvantages of those, apart from the fact they're, they're not self-contained, is that people do not necessarily have to come into the centre and that is the whole point, is to drive football into the town itself. Councillor McDade, followed by Councillor Dugan. Thank you, Convener. Um, I think this is a, a very interesting proposal, and I'm hoping it's going to be a great success for you. Um, my ward has the Enchanted Forest in it, so I'm well aware of uh, the benefit that it can bring at an off-peak time of year, uh, although it does bring its challenges as well, and it's a few of the sort of points I'd like to come across. But um, one of my concerns about your your uh, proposal is around the ticket prices um, there's not an awful lot of uh, distinction between your ticket price for example and the Enchanted Forest which has been going for over 10 years um, and I think that from my point of view you might be better off with lower ticket prices in your introductory years before you get uh, well known um, and therefore you can establish yourself better um, and I'd be I'm slightly concerned around perhaps the numbers that you're expecting if people think it's maybe a bit too high if they don't know what it is in its first year obviously the enchanted forest has a national name and it can it, it charges 20 pounds which you know uh, for an adult which is only four pounds more than what you're proposing to charge so i'm just wondering whether it might be better off with some lower introductory prices to, or at least even and I, I know that it does say that you will adjust it perhaps depending on how things go, but I think that might be something to take on board. Um, I'm also concerned perhaps about um, the parking is a big issue in Pitlochry around Enchanted Forest time, uh, and Creef is similar to Pitlochry in terms of it's a tourist town in general, so are you quite confident that 
the parking in the town will be able to cope with the, the demand of visitors coming through because I know it was quite a short performance essentially the Enchanted Forest people are parking for several hours so they're essentially out of the forest for three hours uh, at a time so that takes up much longer perhaps than what your time space is going to take up but that's just another point to consider. Sorry, Council McDade, was that would be I'm looking for an answer for the, that? The parking was a point, uh, it was a, uh, well, in fact, both kind of um, question slash points around the pricing and whether they're going to consider, you know, a lower price if they're not getting so much uptake and also around the parking. Are you comfortable to answer those questions? Mr. I Kim? am, yes. Um, well, the production team behind, um, let's call it Horrible Histories, um, a, a very great experience, obviously, um, working with Enchanted Forest. So ticket pricing, uh, for instance, will be flexible, be based on demand, the old supply and demand uh, approaching the uh, events. And certainly, I'll take back your comments in terms of ticket pricing in comparison to other uh, similar events uh, in the county. In terms of parking, parking is always um, a problem, whether it's in Perth or whether it's in Pit Lockery, whether it's in Creef. Um, the one thing that we're aware of is that we will need to make sure that uh, all the available parking um, is clear to visitors. And what we're looking at is, if you like, 7,500 tickets over two five-day periods. So 7,500 divided by 10, and then the number of cars that, that potentially bring those visitors. So we're confident we do have the capacity. It's early evening, so the streets uh, round about the centre of town and the car parks should be fairly clear. But it is one thing that we'll be looking at to make sure that people are not driving endlessly around looking for somewhere to park. So thank you for that. Thank you. Councillor Dugan. Thank you, Convener, um, and thank you, Mr. Coombe. Uh, I enjoyed the uh, supplementary information uh, that you provided over and above the report. I think this sounds like a very exciting event for Creef and, and holds great promise for what it, can, uh, what it can do for the town. I think by way of an observation, uh, and I take what you're saying about that you're working with people who are very experienced in these things, um, it, it, it does seem to be a little bit of something that if somebody else is doing somewhere else the only original bit about it you could be accused of, and I'm sure you'd rebut this, is grief. Um, so I'd like to know why a family uh, may wish to choose to spend £50 to come to see your event in grief, and I think it's important that we understand that. Um, so I'm very supportive uh, 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 of, of the application. I've got two questions. Um, the first would be, on the basis that I hope this is a success, what would be the second biggest success that bids achieved over the last two and a half years? And my second question um, would be, is how are you demonstrating the level of community support for this that you've got? That's three questions. I've got Alzheimer's, I think. Right, the first question in terms of um, our unique selling proposition is that for those of you who are able to get through to Spirits of Schoon and see the production there, you'll know that it's very different to Enchanted Forests. And in terms of um, the event that we plan to put on, uh, it will be more than Spirit to Schoon. It will be much more of a theatrical uh, interaction between uh, professional actors who will, if you like, play out roles around the, the castle itself, uh, together with lighting um, and projection onto the walls of the, the castle itself. And in years two, three, and so on, what we will aim to do is to take that event out into the garden, so in year one, in, in November, fingers crossed, the gardens will be lit up, and then in years two and three, the actual event will move out into the garden. So we believe that the theatrical elements and the musical elements, the fact we have a Christmas market, makes it very different to uh, other events. In terms of um, uh, bid itself, for those of you who've been following progress of bid, I, I think it's fair to say that um, Creef bid has had its problems. Um, I would be the third manager, and that's not necessarily uh, a reflection of the task we have, and that in itself has meant that some of the things that we want to roll out have not happened as quickly as we'd like. What I would say is that things are beginning to happen, and on Monday, this Monday, we're launching uh, the Creef card, which is very similar uh, in all respects to the Perth City card. We're really pleased with it. It's had a fantastic um, support from uh, the retailing side of, um, of Creef. It doesn't suit everybody, but certainly in the high street, we've got over 50 businesses already signed up which is quite a significant marker based on the normal um, results that MyConnex, who were using a supplying partner, would see in the first couple of days of the rollout. They would normally see maybe 20, 25, 30, and we've had 
over 50 businesses sign up. And that in itself is a significant um, result for the card, and we see that growing as year goes by. Secondly, we will be running a comedy festival at the end of July. It's three nights, four venues, 60 comedians. And we think, again, it, it's part of that event strategy, which, if this goes through today, the Drum and Gardens event will be the, if you like, the spotlight on Cree. And these events are not just about the 10 days in December or the three days in July. It's all about the marketing that goes into those events to promote them, such that the profile of Cree is always in the public eye. It's not about 15 days of the year. And in terms of uh, community engagement, um, I mean, I appreciate that we have 7,500 people live in Cree. And if we could get them to change their habits, to, to switch off the internet, then grief would be a thriving, bustling town. The gifts that we have, if you like, the assets of grief are more tourist-related, um, and that was one of the key focuses when we embarked on delivering the grief business plan. What we're not forgetting, though, is those businesses and the community uh, within grief. We know, and most of you have read various papers, that for every pound that's spent in a local economy, at least 65 pence, 70 pence, will stay in the local economy. It will pay the business owner. It will pay locally sourced product. It will pay the employee. That employee will shop in Cree. So we have a constant message, and the challenge has always been, you'll know yourselves, communication. And, and above anything else, communication with the local community is probably the biggest challenge that we face during the next eight months. Thank you, Mr. Coombe. Do we have any more questions for Mr. Coombe? We, I think um, Councillor Williamson was first followed by Councillor Ling. Okay, Councillor Ling then. Thanks, uh, Neil. Um, it was really following on from Councillor Dugan's question. It was um, just some proof of what you have delivered. This is a, a large sum of uh, council taxpayers' money that we're putting forward there. And it was just, I didn't really get... Um, a sense of what had been delivered on this scale or even on a smaller scale over the last three and a half years. It's That's a good point, and I think if you look at the, uh, the business plan, I don't know whether any of you have had an opportunity to look at the, the bid uh, website, you'll see there's been a significant delivery of the plans. And I think going back to the, the, what we're talking about today, we, we have we supported um, local events and delivered something like £20,000 of investment in those events. But those events themselves are delivered by enthusiasts, there's been a, a quality to those delivery and for those of you who are familiar with the uh, diaspora, the three year um, grief for members in the arts festival uh, production last year, that's just one example of where BID has uh, sought to deliver and support those events. So in that respect, uh, we have delivered and they have been successful. In terms of this strategy, what we've realised is those local events do not have the wide appeal which will drive significant footfall through the town. And what the business levy payers are looking to see is, if you like, a return on their investment, which is why we're embarking on this strategy this year. So if I can give you the, uh, the website address, it's creepsucceeds.com. Um, there, there are four strands to the business plan, and you'll see we've made significant strides in all those areas. Always difficult um, to, if you like, fly the flag and shout from rooftops about the things that we have done. But if I go back to the events, I go back to the Business Improvement Grant Scheme, which is another example of uh, how we're helping business in the town. Then these are all significant things that we've done in the last two and a half years. Oh, oh, uh, thanks for that. I was just I had a couple of questions, but I was giving you them one at a time because I think other council <laughs> doing another question was how can you demonstrate community support, not the business community, but the community, because that's one of the criteria and 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 in the paper, and I'm fully supportive of it. I would like to see this event succeed, but it's just, I need to be convinced that it can succeed. So that's one question. So if you can show me community support, evidence it. And the other question is um, the risk around having this event in the first week of December when pe money is tight, Christmas is coming along, and um, people have got their last wage packet before they have to pay for all the Christmas associated uh, uh, things associated with Christmas uh, and I wonder what that risk would be to your uh, the ability to attract the 7,500 visitors. I think you set your second question first because that's the one I remembered. Um, 
Yes, there's, there's always going to be a risk. Uh, and what we see this event is, if you like, enhancing the, uh, the start to Christmas. It will have a very festive feel to it, although there's this horrible history element, if you like. There'll be historical characters in a festive context. And I don't disagree, but what I would say is it, it actually enhances the, the, the spirit of Christmas and the festivities. We have the Christmas light switch on the week before. And one could say the same thing about other events around the county. What we do know is there's still an appetite for this type of event and we believe this has uh, got a unique selling proposition in terms of theatricals associated with it. In terms of community engagement, if we look back on the events that we supported in the last two years, we supported the Science Festival at the uh, community campus, uh, the Arts Festival, the Highland Gathering. All these events really have that local appeal supported by the local community. In that respect, yes, there's still work to be done and you'll, you'll know yourselves in the work that you do, it's very difficult to engage and get the, the message over. And that is one of the things that we'll be working to, to ensure that not only are we looking to drive football from further afield, but we're looking to engage with the local community such that they can enjoy uh, the Drummond Garden spectacular. Thank you, Councillor Lee. Councillor Williamson, and followed by Councillor Donaldson, Councillor Bell. Thank you very much, convener. Um, my first question is, is essentially around, um, in 1.2 here, you say that the average cost for 7,500 is 12 pound 54 per ticket, which is a division of 7,500 amongst your 100,000 or total income. Councillor Williamson, can I just interrupt you? I think that's a question we can maybe take in the report. Would you mind holding off until we, we well, get to the report? I was wondering what, why, why the figures haven't been matched against uh, its expenditure. Can you answer that, Mr. King? It's based on the ticketing model. The model itself will be flex. Um, and you'll know yourself that we can make spreadsheets say and tell any story that we want. This is just an indicative story of where we think we're going to end up uh, with revenue and where we think we're going to end up in cost. Now, it could well be that um, we're not right on cost, we're not right on revenue. But we've taken averages based on the ticketing experience that our production team have. And this is where we've come to in terms of income, expenditure, and the application for today. So, so it very much looks like you've already built in a, a loss into the event before you've even started. So therefore, have you identified other potential funding opportunities or have you got people who have committed to funding the event for you? There's, there are no, at the moment, there are no other funding opportunities on the table. Um, this has been a long, tortuous um, route to here. And what's great this year is we have this rural events fund to draw on and to apply to. Once we get the go-ahead, if you like, from this chamber, we can then talk to other potential sponsors um, so that we can close the gap. And the reason for coming to you today is to look for that start-up cost, which will, will get the event up and off the ground, and then years two and three, we'll be looking for additional funding and sponsorship. Next up, I think, was Councillor Donaldson. Thank you, Kundrino. Uh, could I just uh, say to Neil Combe, just a very quick observation. I welcome some of these recent initiatives, the Greek Card, the Comedy Festival. There's also the marketing and design facility uh, probably going to come about, I think I'm right in saying, at the campus. Um, so, and I think that's helpful because I, I think you need to communicate that. I think it's also got to be seen that Creek Bid is indeed uh, inclusive of all sections of the community, right down to the very small traders in the High Street and King Street. But I, I, I do welcome this event. But to just to follow up on Councillor Williamson's uh, question on future funding, because it's about sustainability, and the Enchanted Forest, I think, had funding from the council over a seven, eight year period, okay, at lower levels, but that was consistent. Here, you're looking for a, a, a one off. 30,000 to pump prime. But for going forward, uh, I would assume one of the possible sources might indeed be Event Scotland with uh, Visit Scotland. Simply, be, uh, would that be the case? And also, would you be looking for sponsorship? I'm thinking of some of the local firms, you know, it would be quite attractive to attach their names to it. I mean, th th yes, you're quite right, Stuart. There are a number of things that we can do. And uh, what I've learned in the 12 months I've done this job is that uh, funding is very difficult to secure, much like yourselves, no doubt. But Event Scotland is certainly the first port of call in the second year. 
um, they've made it quite clear that they will fund events, but only in the second year in terms of additionality. You know, whether that's um, we scale up the show to go into the gardens or we appeal to a wider audience. So there will be attempts um, to, uh, to um, source other areas of funding in year two. And that's not to say if the green light is given today, there will there'll be attempts um, to find sponsors in um, running up to December of this year. Okay, I think we've probably put Mr. Coombe through the mill for the moment, so I'm going to go with Councillor Parrott and Councillor McDade, and then we'll move on to the paper after that. Thank you, Convener. Thank you, Mr. Coombe. It's an, an exciting proposal, and I, I hope you have success. The, um, in the, on the face of it, the £30,000 grant that, that you're seeking in the first year um, is, is, is simply a subsidy that enables the proposal to break even. Are there any aspects of the expenditure in this year that actually make provision for holding the event in future years and, and, and help reduce the, the running costs of it in future years. Thank you. We've looked at the expenditure and um, the one of the things that um, leaps out in terms of cost saving is transport. Um, if we were to ask people to drive to, uh, to Drummond Castle, um, we would therefore do away with all the benefits of bringing the, the event into the town. And whilst Yes, there is a question mark on the £30,000 that's been mentioned. It's a built-in loss. What we also need to consider is economic benefits to the town. If we were to look at 7,500 people times a very sort of cautious low figure of £15 per head spend in the town, that's brought into the economy something like £100,000 over that 10-day period. What was your question? There's nothing unique um, in the event, if you like. A lot of the, the bits, the stuff that will be used to deliver the event are things that have to be hired in, so things like actors, uh, lighting equipment. So there will always be recurring expenses. Um, the expertise in terms of marketing the event, though, is something that we can carry forward into year two, three, and four, and we can, we can rely on that. And the marketing expense should reduce because of the halo effect, if you like, of the event, of the success of the first event. Last, again, no means least, Councillor McDade, and if you could keep it brief, I'd be keep grateful. Keep it very brief, uh, convener. Um, it really is a follow-on, and Councillor Johnson sort of covered it to a degree. Um, my concern is really around the Enchanted Forest, other major events do have, you know, try to build up a cash flow reserve, um, and I'm quite, you know, I'm very supportive of your proposal. Um, but my concern really is about the sustainability and even if you do get Event Scotland funding, we do want to get you to a position where in five years' time you know, you have a large reserve that means that you can pay for all the upfront costs every year. If your event is to grow, your costs will also grow and this is something the Enchanted Forest experiences obviously, so um, it's not even a case of just you know, these costs will all grow and it's about how we're going to make it you know, break even because it actually isn't even breaking even with our 30k subsidy. So, I'm just kind of, that's my concern. I hope really. you wouldn't notice that. Um, I mean, Beard is funded by uh, the levy payers of Creef, and we have a budget of £100,000. And over the last two years, we put £20,000 into these small lo local community events. Now, that's not to say that um, this year and in subsequent years, we won't do that, but we certainly won't do it to the same extent. And we therefore have a surplus that would have, uh, from the business plan, would have been set aside for those local events. So. Bid in itself, although we're a non-profit and not-for-profit limited company, we'll build funds up. So in year three, four, we'll have the funds that we would normally have channeled into the smaller community events. So I can see your point. What we're going to do next year, when there's a £30,000 gap, we will look for additional funding, but we also, through our own uh, revenue stream, through the levy payers, have our own funds. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Coombe. Sure you'll be delighted to take your seat. Thank you very much. I, I like listening to potholes. I thought that's much more interesting. Would you mind switching your microphone off just before you leave? Thank you. Right, I'm going to introduce this paper and then we can talk about that. So the, this committee will be aware that as a result of the council decision, the revenue budget of February, 100,000 of non-recurring money was allocated for rural events funding. The purpose of this report is to seek committee approval towards the proposed approach to the management of this specific fund which in the, is in addition to the core recurring events budget. 
This will allow engagement with event organiser disbursements from this budget to commence. The budget motion stated that this funding was to allow groups in our rural communities to apply for start-up funding for recurring events which will attract visitors from outside the immediate area. This report sets out proposed criteria for this grant, for this grant funding allocation. In addition, the report asks the committee to consider a grant of £30,000 from this new bid to Creef Succeeds Limited. Are there any questions on the paper? Councillor Dugan was first, followed by Councillor... Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, Convener, can I ask you why, um, at your pre-agenda, if officers prepared this paper in this layout with the application to the fund on the same paper as the ratification of the criteria of the fund, you didn't suggest to them that it would be much more appropriate for the two things to be on separate papers? I shall leave Barbara to answer that question, if you don't mind. I, I think that's actually a very good point. I think we were just trying to save papers, if that makes any sense. It wasn't anything deliberate, Councillor Dugan. Thank you, uh, yeah. uh, Mrs Renton. I know it's a very good point. That's why I asked the convener why he didn't pick it up at pre-agenda. I missed it, Councillor Dugan, and I apologise for that. Thank okay. you for raising it. Takes a big man. Thank you. The next one is, uh, convener, is um, do you, again, think it's equitable that we, as a committee, are put in the rather uncomfortable position of uh, having to, on the day we approve the criteria, potentially allow an applicant at the very same time to scoop out 30% of that pot before any groups or activities in any of the other nine eligible wards in Perth and Kin Ross can get access to the fund. So de facto, that if we go with the recommendations of the paper today, the £100,000 fund for rural events in Perth and Kin Ross is actually a £70,000 fund because Creef got in there right at the very outset for some reason. Thank you, Councillor Dugan. It is up to £30,000, and there's a, an issue with timing, given the Christmas date that has already been raised. So I think next was Councillor Parrott, followed by Councillor Reid. Thank you, Arch Convener. I'm, I'm very interested to note at Para 1-4 that Schoon specifically... Um, is, is deemed not to be rural. Um, it, it might have made sense to me if Schoon was included in an exemption with, say, Bridgeverne, Methven and Lunkerty, but, but to single out Schoon, which I don't think does consider itself part of the city, seems to be a, a, a little perverse. Thank you. Alan Graham, I think, can answer that for us, please. Um, I, I, I can see that I can see the mechanism and the linkage there, um, but I think Schoon might be uh, you know, disappointed that they are um, assumed to be part of the city. When I think that many people in Schoon might vehemently say they're not part of the city. Thanks, Mr. Graham. Any comments to make on that? Thank you. Uh, Councillor Reid, I think, was next, followed by Councillor Bailey. Thank you, Convener. Uh, following on from Councillor Dugan's point, has any other group formally put in an application for any of this money? Um, and if so, do we know who they are? Alan Graham again. I think that sounds better now. Thank you. Sorry about that. The microphone has just appeared. Um, 
We have ongoing engagement with some event organizers. This is the first formal written application that we've received since drafting the paper. I have been speaking with uh, event organizers who uh, could be in scope for this support from elsewhere in Perth and Kinross, including Cooper Angus and I believe Kinross. Thank you. So um, my question was um, similar to Councillor Reid's question, but I'd like to specifically get an assurance if there is one available that other groups who'd be likely to put in for this type of funding were aware of it before this committee has come so that they've had a chance to know that this pot is available and that it's not, um, that it's been broadly available really. Thank you, Councillor Bailey. Alan? Uh, yes, we'll do what we can to publicise the, the fund and um, as I say, we have ongoing engagement with different event organisers who come forward with different proposals. Those proposals are sometimes at different uh, levels of maturity in terms of what the event is, so we work with them quite closely to, to hone that and develop the proposition and look at funding as part of that mixture. A follow-up, Councillor Bailey? Sorry, forgive me. The question was um, a, his a historical one, as in have we already made similar groups aware that this funding is available? We have, yes, through that engagement, we have uh, apprised groups that this committee will consider today the criteria uh, and it will come before them. So we can't confirm one way or the other the level of funding support until this committee takes a view. Thank you. Councillor Ling, I was just wondering, uh, Alan, uh, you said since the paper was drafted, uh, could you give me, when was the paper drafted? Oh, it's just in terms of the pipeline for reports. So this is within the, l the past couple of weeks or so. So in the last couple of weeks, but ha, I think the questions are coming is who has been uh, involved with it before that? How did Creef bid know that it was going to be drafted that it would fit the criteria? Um, and and how would other uh, competing bids or, 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 or separate bids uh, have had a chance to bid in before we're giving away 30% of the funding? So the in the specific relation to the CREEF bid proposal, we've had discussions with CREEF bid as part of their ongoing work and programme over the past year or so, aside from the specific event, but that has come forward through discussions and negotiations, et cetera, over a range of things, uh, and apprised, obviously, that this uh, fund had been avail made available through the budget motion. Councillor Ling, if I may just also make you aware, there was a press release linked to the budget motion which was published. Yes, but it wouldn't, the criteria wouldn't be known, so nobody would know. It was very woolly, and it, it's a, it's a, I'm not saying it's not a good thing to do it, but anybody reading the motion and not knowing what the criteria were would be, would, I don't think we'd come forward. I think it's also, if I can ask you, Alan, on point 1.10, you're saying that, um, uh, no, it's sorry, 1.9, the, the request in excess of 10,000K, uh, 10,000 pounds, will be the exception rather than the rule. Yet here you have the first bid in, the only one that's on the table, the only one that's really been, before we've even assessed the criteria, and in your criteria, uh, in your report, you're saying that will be the exception. It is 100%, it's 300% three, it's of what you expected. That, uh, could you answer how that ties in with that point that you've made? I'm just going with uh, previous experience of event funding requests where typically they don't come beyond £10,000. This is an exception in, uh, in accordance with the, the scheme of administration. You have to take it before committee for consideration. I think Barbara's going to comment on this as well, Councillor Ling. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Paragraph 1.5 also indicates that this is the same criteria that we use normally for, you know, sort of events funding. We already have a core budget, um, you know, sort of which over the course of the last number of years has been split 50-50 between Perth and you know, sort of the, the rural um, you know, sort of, um, towns and areas. The report also says that this is you know, sort of for larger scale events, you know, sort of, and we also tend to have, you know, as Alan is saying, an idea of what they might be because there have, has been some previous engagement at some point. It is not for gala days or anything like that because this is about economic development. Does that fit in with the point that 10k over 10k will be the exception rather than the? I think this fits in exactly the same as we did with um, Perth Festival of the Arts at the last committee. 
that you know, sort of within the scheme of, it, uh, of, of administration, that's where it sits. Thank you, Councillor McDade, followed by Councillor Baird. Thank you, Convener. Um, it really follows ideally on from the director's point that she's just been making. Um, in terms of 1.4, where it's talking about the criteria, it excludes gala day type events, bonfire nights, etc. Um, just to use my own word as a parochial example here, uh, we have a gala day next month where there's going to be teams from across Scotland coming to do a part of football festival as part of that. It's an expansion of the gala day. Um, that's people from across Scotland, so you could argue that's of you know, national um, reach, uh, but it wouldn't be eligible under this. Also bonfire nights, but Lottery is re-establishing its bonfire night that it historically ran uh, this year for the first year. Uh, and has been working hard to get startup funding for it. And the theatre uh, the theater used to burn its sets, and it was a huge event, and the hotels used to promote it as off-peak uh, marketing to come to the lottery for the big bonfire and the fireworks, etc. So it did have both a commercial uh, benefit to the town and was a commercial event, essentially, uh, but it, again, wouldn't be eligible under the criteria. Um, so I would like perhaps a reconsideration of the exclusion, and perhaps it could be more... Uh, sort of taken on the basis of things that do have uh, a, a wider reach, so it's not specifically just local stuff, but do have a wider reach, um, but doesn't ex specifically exclude certain types of events, which may well have that wider reach. Um, so my question is, that's one question, can we, exclude, can we take that out of the exclusions? Um, my other question is, what do we count as national importance? Um, I'm you know, not quite sure of what we count as national importance and could we get a bit of a definition around that. Um, sort of region, uh, regional importance might perhaps be equally as, you know, economically beneficial. So, Alan, can you answer both of uh, the Yes, I think that in, in essence, and to, to reassure Councillor McDade, I think the spirit really was that where an event is trying to reach a wider audience, that is the key thing, and that the devil will come down to the detail that particular events offer but where it has the potential to attract visitation from outside the, the immediate area, that is the underlying uh, uh, determinant. And can that event drive tourism to the area as opposed to only exclusively being something for the very local community? So you know, the points taken regarding the specifics around, for example, if it's a, a festivalized uh, event, then there's clearly scope to drive visitation there. Thank you. Councillor Baird was next. Thank you very much. Um, I think I've kind of lost what my questions were going to be because it's kind of gone from one thing to another. But the 100K that this administration puts the budget is, is a really good news story for rural communities. But I think the unfortunate bit is it's got a bit, the water's got muddied today by discussing the CREFID along with the good news bit about the money it's there. And it's reassuring to see in the paper that if the money is not all spent this year, that's going to be carried forward because obviously groups in little villages who didn't think there was any money to do anything, you've got to kind of get the think up the good idea and work it out. So therefore, sorry, it's Councillor Baird, do we have a question? Yeah. So sorry. therefore, it's it, it might take longer even to next year. It might need to lead it further. So this, if this money is to go to another budget year, because people do take a long time to come to decisions about trying to do things in rural areas sometimes. So will the money still be there? Alan, will the money still be there? Well, at, at 1.10, what I've, I've proposed is that if it's not fully expended, then we seek budget flexibility to carry that into, into next year. Uh, sorry, but it is also, you know, sort of intended not just for a small, you know, you know sort of the, the purpose of this is about economic development and the requirement to demonstrate that it will bring that. Okay. Thank you, Barbara. Councillor Robertson, please. Yes, could, could I just ask a question again about the criteria? Um, New events always take a long time to get up and running. Even so, the criteria in, in the paper says it's mainly to support um, events in their first year. Um, the, the one we had the presentation about today, I could imagine will need support perhaps of a few years to come, um, given the figures that were presented in the paper. So can you, how does this the event strategy help to make sure events just don't get funded and then die on the vine. Alan? I think aside from funding, we do spend quite a bit of time with event organisers in terms of these very issues, the uh, sustainability of their event, um, 
particularly through the, their second year, where they have the, the opportunity to look at the likes of Events Scotland's Regional Events Fund, because Events Scotland won't fund an event in its first year, um, to look at uh, revenue savings, etc., and over time to see the Council's contributions in general reducing and other revenue streams coming into play. So there is a fair bit of officer time spent with event organisers over that uh, over that the period of that particular relationship to ensure a level of sustainability. Just as a supplementary to that, so there is the possibility of the council su giving support as well as Events Scotland in su subsequent years to an event. Well that, that's correct. This is um, what I'm concerning because there's a one-off budget uplift. I've attempted to put some colour around the, mo the, the budget motion in terms of eligibility. That's not to say that an event couldn't seek funding through the core events budget, which is the recurring piece. Councillor McDade, second question. If yes. Brief, if you don't mind, please. It's really just to clarify, I don't think I got an answer to my second question the last time around what do we constitute as a large-scale event. And really, just to add to that, 10K is not really an awful lot of money, for example, in a large scale event, the Enchanted Forest is an operation of around a million pounds. That might be classified as a large scale event. So, you know, what, what counts as large and really is this sort of level of money going to get that? Alan? I think events which we, we see have potential to attract visitation. Um, should an event seek a higher level of funding, then we would have to come back to this committee to seek approval, as we have done with, with Creefbid and previously with Perth Festival of the Arts. Um, but I think the, the essence of this uh, budget motion was to aim at local groups and obviously one of the conditions we're saying or suggesting is that they have co-finance coming in so it's not 100% funded by the council. So there is a basket of, of revenues coming forward there. But we again would work with event organisers to explore other funding options as well. Are you happy with that Councillor McDade? And Councillor Waters I believe is next. Thank you. Thank you, convener. Just in relation to uh, risk, risk management and the uh, potential of uh, the weather uh, and how it would uh, impact on, on this event, um, given the time of the year, again, end of November, beginning of December, does the Council have any, any information or anything where they could advise us on um, previous events that have probably been held at this time of the year and how the weather did impact? Do we have any historical information um, given that in, in a rural location, uh, you know, a period of severe weather would, would be a huge risk to the, to the event, I would, I would imagine? Thank you. Uh, we weather is, a, is always a risk at, at any time of year. Um, I think the, the view was taken in the context of Creef to uh, aim for th uh, this side of Christmas for that very reason, because of previous experience through the January-February period and even into March of, of particularly adverse weather. And the risk for outdoor events typically comes from wind as much as it does from, from rain. But th one can only put in so many mitigating factors for outdoor events. I think over the piece in Perth and Kinross we've been relatively lucky in terms of outdoor events that have been impacted. There have been cancellations of things like Highland Games and that's been well documented for example but overall if we look at the year in the round then I think there are relatively few outdoor events that are cancelled because of weather conditions. Um, the onus would be on the event organiser through their own insurances to look at cancellation insurance. So the, the risk would then and the liability would fall on the event organiser. If, if the, uh, we were minded to grant the, the, the money asked for and the event was cancelled, would that be covered under the events organiser insurance that that would be returned or would we lose that? That would be uh, what we're proposing is one of the conditions of funding is that any monies received from the council is, is returned. Um, so that would be the, the onus is very firmly on them in terms of their event insurances. Councillor Donaldson. Um, first of all, as a ward councillor for Strathairn, I do support this application for 30,000. Uh, I would also point out, as Thank Mr. Graham has stated, it is in three. We're still in questions, Councillor Johnson. Is this what I want to ask, though, 
is that I think what is unfortunate here is that this has been conflated with the paper on the criteria. So what I want to ask is why that paper on the criteria didn't come earlier if there was an E&I meeting on the th uh, 21st of March. Secondly, there are other pots of money, some of which will come before this committee. It is the Enterprising Rural Pasture Programme, Rural Business Expansion Scheme, the Tourist Routes Programme. There's also the much larger one, 600,000, for the Community Fund. So can we expect a future meetings in the near future that we will get the criteria listed for these funds and in particular I think with some smaller rural pots of money funds um, the next E&I meeting is not until September and a lot of these are non-recurring so we're going to have a limited time span before the end of the financial year that's my question is when will we get more detail thank you Councillor Donaldson I'll ask Barbara to answer that question okay thank you for your question Councillor Donaldson obviously you know sort of the the team that works on events is very small, you know, sort of there's Alan basically and then Michael Boyle. So it is a matter of, you know, sort of the resources that we have available in terms of how we can bring these papers forward. Um, you know, sort of the, um, the community challenge fund money, you know, sort of the £600,000 will not come to this committee, that will go to SPNR and I understand that that will be on the agenda for um, the, the SPNR committee coming up in June. Um, you know, sort of, but we will, uh, we are, you know, sort of within the resources we've got available to, as I say, in a very small team, be trying to bring those papers to the next committee in September. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to move the paper and then if I can have someone to second it, please. Then we'll do comments. Thank you, Councillor Hearn, second that. Open up the paper to comments now, please. Councillor Hearn was first followed by Councillor Donaldson. Thank you very much, Convener. The Council's had an events policy for many years and we're now seeing the increase of events coming to Perth as we enhance our reputation as a specialist destination. It's great that the CREEF and the CREEF bid are looking to put on this annual event and I'm glad the funds are available to help rural areas overcome the hurdles of the first year. I hope that other area, rural areas take advantage of this funding to build events all over Perth and Kinross. This is a good event, well thought out and has the potential to boost the local economy of CREEF and the surrounding area which is exactly what the fund was set up to do. I'm delighted to support this venture and I wish them luck in the future. Councillor Dugan. Thank you, Convener. <coughs> I think um, it's always good when we get an issue that's uh, robustly uh, and, and healthily challenged and debated in the Chamber and this has been one of those items. I think um, we've covered the conflation of the two items and we don't need to go back to that. Um, but uh, I think if what we've registered is an element of scepticism among, amongst committee members today uh, and an element of frustration about uh, the timing of events um, um, here uh, today, I think there are some question marks about the criteria that we're being asked to approve. Um, I, and I think uh, members have voiced their concerns about the overly constrictive nature of some of those um, requirements that we're being asked to agree to. So with that in mind, convener, I'd like to propose an amendment uh, to your motion um, and I can detail that uh, whenever you'd like. Thank you very much, Councillor Dugan. We'll, if it's okay with you, we'll take further comments first then of come course. back to that. Do we have any other comments? <coughs> Seems we don't need to take any more. Oh. Yeah, thank you, convener. Um, I mean, I would, I'm very supportive, obviously, of uh, money into rural areas and, you know, particularly uh, rural events, great things, uh, and my ward relies on them heavily, so I'm very supportive of the fund, um, and I think that should be welcomed. I have c concerns, as I've already outlined, about um, some of the wording of the paper, and if that can perhaps be uh, tidied up a bit when it goes out to community groups for promotion, so that people who are perhaps organising events that do have a wider appeal uh, might not be deterred perhaps by the description and the criteria. I would certainly welcome that. Uh, I am concerned about the, the fact that we've got the two papers conflated and the director has already explained uh, about that. And I, I am very concerned also about the level of funding this is going to take out of that pot. Um, and it, it is quite a sizable amount of money. So, uh, you know, I have reservations about it, but I welcome proposal in general terms 
um, and I would seek your assurance that there will be a bit of tidying up in terms of some of the points I have outlined. Thank you, Councillor McDade. The paper does say up to 30,000. It doesn't say it has to be 30,000. Can we see what uh, Councillor Stugan's amendment is and that may satisfy some of your concerns? Yeah. Councillor Dugan, over to you. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, the first issue is on item 1.4 of the paper um, uh, and I would uh, uh, request that Schoon Village is included in this scheme um, uh, uh, or perhaps uh, all of Schoon, given that the, the scheme is open to groups and I would suggest that we can easily demonstrate that Schoon Palace, which is clearly a consideration, isn't a group. So I would ask that we include Schoon uh, in the scheme um, and uh, I would also um, ask that um, the uh, um, item on a, a above a which references um, if, or below rather, which references, for example, gala days, type events, bonfire nights, etc., is struck from the criteria, thereby allowing people that no matter what the event is, if they can demonstrate the appropriate scale, that they'll qualify for the scheme. That's the limit of the changes to paragraph 1.4. Uh, also in paragraph 1.7, that it says uh, that it should say an event which is in its first or second year picking up on Councillor Robertson's point and presents a robust indication of ongoing viability. I don't think it's sufficient to say, convener as the paper does, that it appears viable. It's overly subjective and a little bit watery. Um, and further down from that, uh, where uh, the paper currently says there are other sources of funding projected, that should be changed to there are other sources of income identified, including ticket sales, sponsorship and other grants, etc. And because we've got a conflated paper, my final element, convener, is that we award uh, the CREF bid £15,000 this year and £15,000 next year. Thank you, Councillor Dugan. Can you just elaborate your second last one, which I think was in the second but last point of 1.7. Indeed. So it currently says the event owner is an established and constituted body. And can, oh sorry, it's, it's the second last one. There are other sources of funding projected, including ticket income. So it's to remove the word projected um, and uh, insert uh, income identified. So it's just to be income identified rather than projected because you can project what you like. It's harder to actually identify what it is. It's about the robustness of the application. I think, Councillor Dugan, I'm inclined to agree with some of your points. I'm inclined to agree with you on Schoon. Mm -hmm. I think I'm inclined to agree with you on everything regarding the 15,000. I think I've been persuaded that 30,000 to Creef is, is a good amount, and I'd be quite keen to keep that in the paper. But I'm happy with the other amendments that you've suggested. Okay, well, that, well, thank you for that, convener. I, I'm happy to move the amendment on the basis that we award 15 over two years rather than 30 in one year. I think that protects the council and this fund. Right, it seems that we've got an amendment, which is probably slightly complicated now, and I'll leave that to the experts in democratic services to, to sort. I will Sorry, of course, yes. Seconder? Seconder for your amendment, Councillor Dugan? Very hard to pro stand up when you promised. <laughs> <laughs> You've been elevated. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm very happy to second uh, this for all the reasons that Councillor Dugan uh, did, and I also think it's beneficial for the, the, the Creef project. To, if, if we're able to do it for the first two years, we give them 15,000 just now, and the, we're giving them 15,000 next year. So we're not cutting to the, the, the funds going to the project, we're actually giving them the comfort of knowing that if this year's a success, they've got a starting point for next year. So I, I don't see... Uh, I think it's a win-win for them. Um, so for that reason, I'm happy with all the points that Councillor Dugan put forward. Thank you, Councillor Lane. Over to Christina. 
Okay, so Digging, can I just clarify a few points with you? Um, we've agreed that Schoon Village will be included in the scheme. We're removing the exclusions listed in paragraph 1.4. Only these words, uh, Christina, um, only the words that... Um, Do you have a copy of your amendment? No. Yeah. No, only the words that say... Yeah. For, for, so it's from where, it's, where it says including comma, that should just then become a full stop. And yeah. so that, for example, gala days, type events, bonfire nights, etc. So that just needs removed. Okay. It's overly prescriptive. Yeah, but you've agreed as a committee yeah. that you're, you're going to do that. Yeah. Um, your next point was about Thank you. Uh, Schoon Village, but then you said wider Schoon provided it was a group. Is that what? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm anticipating some of the concern is around Schoon yes. Palace, which is yep. clearly not a group. Yes. So we could include all of the ward, all of Strathmore Ward, because on the on the pr on the with the protection that Schoon Palace is not a group. Right. So, so I think we just they need to be, be eligible very anyway. Yep. So we can include you know yep. all around the okay. you know the whole ward. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, the only thing that we still to agree on is the actual funding. So I'll take the vote based on the funding. Yeah, th there was elements Sorry. of paragraph 1.7 as well, convener. So, in one Sorry, 1.7, that was in relation to other sources of income being identified. Identified yeah. at the line um, where it says appears viable. We need to have that to say um, a I think you were taking out the word projected and, yeah. and put identified. Is that yes. right. summarised that yes. correctly? Yes, in the second so in the se Identified mm -hmm. ticket income. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, for the first line, where it just says appears viable, that has to be an event which is in its first or second year, that's important, yeah. uh, and presents a robust indication of ongoing viability. Councillor Baird very helpfully has pointed out the first or second year criteria is further down the list, so my apologies, convener, that's already made an accommodation for. Okay. And Christina, the funding thing was it was the phasing of the funding. Yeah, over three years. Yeah. 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 If we're in agreement that Councillor Diggins' amendment has. Um, the majority of it has been agreed by the committee. I think the only thing that's outstanding is the funding. Um, so we have a motion by Councillor Forbes, seconded by Councillor Ahern, um, to move the paper as it is. Oh, sorry, to, to move the paper in accordance with Councillor Dugan's amendment, subject to um, the funding being up to thirty thousand. We have amendment from Councillor Dugan, seconded by Councillor Lane, um, again agreeing the majority of what was in the amendment, um, with the funding being £15,000 this current year and £15,000 in the next year. Yeah. Can I? Year. Barbara will try very hard to explain this. Um, you know, sort of the, the it is a one-off, a hundred thousand pounds non-recurring. Obviously, you know, sort of what um, the head of finance built into, you know, sort of the um, medium-term financial plan 
was the opportunity to understand that at some point, as Councillor Donaldson has suggested, that sometimes it takes a while for officers to be able to, to bring papers forward to agree criteria, you know, sort of for various things. So um, Stuart McKenzie, in his report, had said that there would be times when it would be difficult for all of that money to be spent in the one financial year. Um, you know, sort of what will then happen is, as part of the budget process, um, you know, sort of I, as the executive director, would be making, you know, sort of proposals for budget flexibility, um, and there is a very narrow criteria for that. You know, sort of I can only budget flex well, in the old environment service about three hundred to four hundred thousand um, pounds. If I'm then taking part of this money to budget flex, you know, sort of next year then that gives you know, sort of the whole service slightly less than they will be able to budget flex. But the purpose of it was to say that we understood that for something like this, it may not always be possible to spend all of the money in that year. What you are actually, you know, sort of, um, the, the, the decision I think you're making here is about whether you want to do you know, all of it up front or to split it across two years. I would suggest that then what might happen is other groups may ask for the, for the same thing when that happens, then I have got less other budget flexibility to, to play with, for want of a better expression. So, so just for my own clarification, if £100,000 is allocated this year, CREEF will still get £15,000 for next year? If that's the will of the committee, yes, then, but, you know, so, but understanding that you know, that will have an impact on other budget flexibility proposals I would be bringing forward for the whole of the rest of the service. Councillor Dugan had a point to make. Yeah, thank you, Convener. Just very quickly, it's my belief that uh, Councillor Ellingworth won't be eligible to uh, vote, given that he wasn't present for the whole of the debate. I wasn't aware of that. I wasn't aware that he had left the room. Did you leave the room, Councillor, during this particular debate? Okay. Councillor Ellingworth, you won't be able to vote on this. Christina, I shall leave it in your hands. Councillors, when I call out your name, could you please tell me if you're voting for the motion or the amendment? Councillor Alistair Bailey. Amendment. Councillor McDade. Amendment. Councillor Kathleen Baird. Councillor Stuart Donaldson. Councillor Dave Dugan. Amendment. Councillor Angus Forbes. Motion. Councillor Anne Jarvis. Councillor Grant Lane. Amendment. Councillor Rahern. Motion. Councillor Parrott. Councillor Reid. Motion. Councillor Robertson. Councillor Waters. Councillor Williamson. The results of the votes is seven to the motion and seven to the amendment. In this um, event, the convener has a casting vote. Yeah. The motion is passed eight votes to seven. Thank you very much, everyone. Let's move on to item seven on our agenda today. This paper is regarding vehicle activated signs. With the, with the budget motion monies this year and in 1718, additional staff resources and dedicated budget has enabled the council's traffic and network to develop and implement a vast program across the council area. Last year, priority was directed to those communities where a commitment has already been given to install a new or replace an existing VAS. Over the last year, 30 new VAS sites were installed and 10 existing VAS upgraded as part of the new VAS programme across the local road network. 
In addition, four sites where signs have been temporarily deployed for short periods of time as part of a rotating programme have been made permanent. As the project has progressed, has progressed, requests for additional VAS have been submitted from local elected members and community councils. A total of 41 new VAS sites have been requested so far. In addition, it is planned to upgrade 10 existing permanent VAS and make 14 temporary VAS permanent. The project is scheduled over two financial years. Any underspend in the budget will allow additional VAS sites to be included in the programme. Do we have any questions? Councillor Robertson. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, these VAS signs are very, very popular with the public, and I think they're very effective. But it seems much easier to install the VAS signs that are um, solar powered than it is the ones that require electricity. And when, why do we, how do we make the judgment of which type of sign we put in? And is it more expensive to use the solar powered one? Brian, can you answer that? Yeah. The cost of the signs between a, a solar and a, a, power, a powered sign, there's really not an awful lot between it. Um, clearly from the, the sign that's powered from a, a, a permanent supply, it depends where that supply is coming from. So the costs vary um, very much, but there isn't an awful lot between it. Um, your first question, sorry, Councillor, was... No, it was just, it, the question I was asking was, is it, is it more economic to install, the, which ones are easiest to install and the most economic to run? That's really the question. Yeah, in simple terms, the easiest one to install is a solar one because you can pretty much put that where you wish. Um, but they, they're, they're more reliable or they're permanently fed with a, a power supply. So our... our intention at the outset would be to have power supplied signs and um, but where particularly in rural locations where um, it may be a sign that we're putting into one drivers of a junction ahead then there will be no power supply out in, in the rural settings so we will use a solar powered sign for that situation thank you next up was councillor williamson followed by councillor uh, thank you convener i was wondering if it's possible for uh, the criteria around how each of these sites was actually selected uh, and where priority was given. Um, was it priority was based on need of, uh, of location or was priority given on the fact that communities where a commitment was given? Where was the priority? Okay. I think where uh, possible we've tried to deliver on, on demand. Uh, th it's been a very, very popular um, project um, in, in both years and demand has been incredible and uh, to date we have not resisted any of the requests. Um, so really it's been demand led. Barbara Renton's also going to comment on that. Okay. Um, when this was first discussed as a part of the budget process last year as well, Councillor Williamson, then there was a list you know, sort of that had been circulated, I believe, to through through that process. Okay. Thank question. So, so therefore, if a community has been advised it was going to get one, I would have expected it to be on that list. Is is or one of the lists? Is that is that correct? I've I've got a community like Tomobre or Strathtomo, for example, who was uh, who were I was advised was going to be getting a a vehicle activated sign has has not received one. Yet it falls into the quite criteria of the uh, and also the equality assessments as well. Second point, Tomo Bridge. Tomo Bridge has had a long-standing issue with uh, road safety in it, and one of the uh, the community members has been advised they're going to receive one of these signs potentially. Again, nothing. So I was just wondering where, why is why is Tomo Bridge in Strathtomo, which really do need them no footpaths no street lights no nothing why have they been excluded from this and other communities have been selected i don't begrudge anybody anything but i just want a clear indication of where the priorities started and stopped could perhaps daryl could answer that question or yeah. or brian or someone <coughs> in relation to straff um we're currently working on the proposals for a reduced speed limit through the village uh, I'm not aware or, or if it's possibly an oversight on our part for not including it on the list. It can certainly be added to the list. In Tummel Bridge, we've been looking at Poppin Crossings. There have been issues about the, the footways. Again, I'm not aware of a specific reference for a vehicle activated sign within Tummel Bridge, but the councillor is correct. There are a number of other road safety concerns within the community. 
Uh, next up, we're going to Councillor Hepburn. Uh, Hepburn to follow, follow up. I do apologise. Well, well, I, I understand. I've got the emails here from 2016, 2017, where there was going to be a follow up to the road safety measures that have been placed into Tunnel Bridge. My constituents are very angry that there doesn't appear to have been any follow up with them. And I believe they've had meeting with, meetings with officers where they were advised that one of the measures that was going to be looked at was going to be the installation of a, a vehicle activated speed sign. I did speak to you in March about getting a, uh, a vehicle activated sign in Strathtumal as part of the package <coughs> that's coming th through in future papers. And you advised me that Strathtumal would be getting a, a road safety sign. So. I don't understand why they were excluded from this from this package of, of uh, measures. I'm just wondering if we're getting into too such a minute sort of ward issue. Would you be comfortable if we made sure that Daryl was available to meet with you as soon as possible to try and resolve this issue specifically no, to you? No, I wouldn't because I feel uh, a little bit let down by this, and I'm the post councillor who has, has had to take flack for issues who have got a, uh, a long history behind them. And really, I'm looking for some form of resolution to this. And um, I don't understand, for example, why we can't take the, the existing speed signs that are currently being replaced and put them in, uh, into communities such as Tunnel Bridge or um, Strath Tunnel. Maybe this is a solution to it, but I, I feel we need to find why, why are Strath Tunnel and, Str and Tunnel Bridge being excluded from this? Where were the priorities? in outlining where the cases were for each individual community, which, which communities got priority over other communities. Darrell, can you answer that quite briefly? Uh, the, as Brian had explained, the, we've tried to accommodate each of the sites as they've been requested. It appears that there's been an oversight on our part and we have failed to include Strath Tommel within the, the list that's contained within the report. We can certainly add that into it. There is scope within the budget to include these extra sites. Um, so we can prioritise, we, we can ensure that Tumble Bridge and Strath Tumbel are now included within the programme. In relation to relocation of some of the temporary signs which have currently been deployed in the past and which are now being upgraded, we are having problems maintaining uh, the working operation of those signs. The signs that have been deployed in the past only display a slow down message. They don't match what we're recommending here where it displays the vehicle speed and gives either a negative or positive response to the driver. So if we were going to introduce signs in Strath Tumble and Tumble Bridge, they would be to the new criteria rather than trying to reuse old stock. Thank you. I take it therefore can answer that Strath Tumble and Tumble Bridge are going to be included in, in these these papers. Is yes. correct? Okay. Thank you. Councillor Ahern, followed by Councillor Baird. Thank you very much, Convener. It's just based on a conversation I've been having with um, Brian with regards to uh, a request I put in in May last year for a VAS sign to be put on the Isla Road um, shortly after the Main Street Junction. Um, I just wanted to make sure that it was going to be included in the 2018-19 list. I know it's not been assessed yet, but I just wanted to confirm that it'll be put on the list that's in the paper. Yes, Councillor, yeah, we, we spoke the other day and we did confirm that it is on that list. The list is starting to grow already. Um, the intention would be um, that if funding allows that we will bring requests forward and, and, and deliver them. I think probably to cover uh, Councillor Williamson's earlier uh, comment as well, I think to be fair to the staff uh, who are carrying out the project, it's quite an enormous project to undertake. I think this year alone we have 60 sites. And that requires us to, to produce location plans and consult with all of the communities and elected members in these wards um, and thereafter try and deliver. Um, so it is a, a major project and we can only apologise if there has been some oversight. There's no intention in that um, and we will deliver um, the, all these sites this financial year. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Baird followed by Councillor Donaldson. Thank you, Convener. Um, just to ask, why are some signs just temporary and others have been made permanent? Because I know the people who, who have them there now think they're going to be there temporarily, permanently. Um, they're all permanent. The ones that we're installing are all permanent now. I think what, what we used to in the past, um, when we had finite budgets to work with, um, we had signs that we'd rotate around uh, various locations where we've had requests or concerns raised with us 
and we would rotate these on a, a period basis. We're now phasing that out because the funding's been made available and the, and the demand is there. So all the sites that we're now installing are permanent sites. Councillor Donaldson, followed by Councillor Reid. Thank you. First of all, just a quick point, uh, and that's on pages 31 and 32. Uh, Muthal, much as uh, it links in in so many ways with Creef, um, is not in Ward 6. It should be in Strathall, and just a, a factual point. But actually it raises a broader issue. The question I really want to ask is this paper is in the name of the administration. We have 116 sites either installed this financial year or next year. Can I just ask, out of 116, why only two are in Strathairn? Can one of you gentlemen answer that? The list that we are working from is, is from a, a request that we've received. Um, so it's, there's no bias in any way with, with regards to any of the wards or that. It's just been as we've received, we've added them to the list. Can I just follow up? Quick supplementary then. Obviously there is uh, the question of the A85 Bear Scotland. That's a separate issue. I know the ward councils need to look at this. But if an individual ward council, not just all three ward councils, makes a request for one or two of these VAS signs in either Broich Road or in the bridge going from Bridge End to North Bridge Street, which is also an issue, but it's in particular Broich Road, you would seriously look at these requests? Yes. Good. Well, you will be getting a uh, request. Thank you, Councillor Donaldson. Uh, moving on to Councillor Reid, followed by Councillor Jarvin. Thank you, Convener. It's a very uh, similar theme, as you'll guess. If local residents identify areas um, that you have not identified in, I'm talking off the order, is there a mechanism by extra funding that these could be put in, or is it just a request uh, into general funding? Um, the scale of the project, uh, we're, we probably do not have the ability to be proactive, so as I've said previously, it has all been done by demand. Um, again, the scale of the project is an exceedingly difficult project to deliver in one year, um, and so where we've had communities who perhaps have been able to, to fundraise or provide uh, uh, funding for a sign, then these ones have become a, a priority to us and we're able to deliver them quicker. Um, but we're trying to work our way through 60 sites just now, um, and it's, it's, it is going to take us all of this financial year. Okay, so supplementary. While I appreciate that when you're driving through Mutho, if you get a gree, wee green uh, smile, it's great, but the cost of a smile element is about £400. Are there areas where the smile might not be worth it? Sorry, I'm, I'm not understanding the question. You're being a bit obtuse. Uh, a, a, a sign with a smile costs about just over 2,000. A sign without a smile, can you can get it for about 1,600, I've been informed. I, I got that from the manufacturers. The signs that we're using are pretty much a standard sign, and the cost does come between... The sign itself is probably about £1,500, but the installation costs uh, make the sign about three and a half to 4,000. There is very little difference between the, the smiley face sign and the one that gives you back a, 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 a reading of your, your speed. Um, the ones that we're putting in with the smiley face sign seem to be the exception, and the majority that we're putting in that the public and the community seem to wish is the one that's, that's reflecting the driver's speed. Um, so it's, that's, that's the, the route that we've went down. So there, proportionally, there's very, very few um, smiley face signs that we're installing. Uh, Barbara's going to make a comment on that as well, please, Councillor Reid. Not about the smiley faces, unfortunately, or the, the thank you. It's just, you know, sort of, it's to reflect the fact that, you know, sort of this programme has come about by additional resources that we've been put in as part of the budget process. You know, sort of, I think we're already identifying through a number of things, that, you know, sort of, that we could carry on, you know, the list. As soon as we fi finish this list or agree this list, there could be potentially more, you know, sort of, and it will then go back to what the budget that we have 
to be able to deliver this as well. And you know, sort of, it's just one of these unfortunate things. I think that Daryl has probably spent a number of years, you know, sort of dealing with a very, very long list and being n never being able to agree any of this. You know, sort of. So the fact that we've got this fund down, you know, sort of, we've had it, you know, sort of, last year and over the course of the next two years. But it is finite, you know, sort of, and any decision to take money from, you know, sort of, to put more money into the VAS project would mean that other road safety initiatives wouldn't necessarily be undertaken. Thank you, Barbara. We're going on to Council Jarvis, followed by Council Waters. Thank you, Convener. Uh, firstly, could I say that Almond Bank and Pitkey and Green are listed in the report as being in Ward 9. They are actually in Ward 5. I don't want somebody else to get these uh, signs, please. Um, the, the Almond Bank and Stanley ones will be greatly appreciated because these are areas which give a great deal of concern when speeding takes place. But one that keeps coming back is Marshall Way in Munkerty. In fact, it was discussed at the Community Council last night. Is this on the radar for this scheme, maybe in the, what would it be, 2 20 Because it's not actually listed. Um, to date, Council, we haven't been asked for a, a vehicle activated sign in Marshall Way. We, we have, uh, I think I replied to your email earlier on this morning, um, you had a query from last night's meeting um, about the barriers. So we are actively looking at measures in Marshall Way. We're more than happy to add this one to the list if you wish. I can arrange for that to happen. And uh, to my point in the email correspondence we've had uh, last night, that road was considerably dangerous. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Waters followed by Councillor McFade. Thank you, thank you, convener. Uh, just first of all, I think the choice of signs, that, uh, f the vast signs that you've used have been fantastic. They really do grab people's attention and seem to be quite effective. A couple of very quick questions, a bit more general. Um, th th one of the observations is the, the signs seem to trigger um, when you're a lot closer to them than the previous one. Is, is, that, is, that, is that the case? Each individual sign has, in simple terms, a microwave that sits on the top and it sends a, a, a beam out. And that's what, when the vehicle triggers that beam, breaks that beam, that's when the sign actioned. Now, that microwave can be adjusted uh, to any sort of uh, angle we wish. Um, and, and an explanation of it, perhaps, is uh, where you might have a set of traffic signals. They also have a similar microwave on the top. Now, if we want the signals to sit on red for a longer period, we will angle it so that the beam's pointing down. So you actually have to be almost at the signals before it realises that there, there's a demand coming from that leg, um, as opposed to having it casting the beam further out. So you break the, the beam that triggers the signal and lets you to flow through. So we have the ability to adjust these. Um, and in some cases, from this point of view, we would probably want the, the message to be picked up earlier so the beam will be cast further. But if there's any sites in particular that we think we need to look at, we're more than happy to do so. Right, thank you. And, and just an, another quick question on the analysis work that's going to be done on it. Uh, when, when will that be likely to be done and when will we be able to see information on that to see how effective these, these signs are with uh, uh, reducing speed and, and hopefully improving safety? Thank you. Um, as I said earlier on, we have a, quite a, a task on our hands to try and deliver all these signs this, this financial year. Our priority just now is, is, is to identify the sites, to, to consult with the community and elected members to get agreement on the locations, and then place the order with the, the company for the provision of the signs and put all the other eggs and uh, ducks in line and, and deliver. Um, during the year, uh, we will endeavour to, to, to carry out that monitoring and, and feedback to, to committee at some point. Thank you. Thank you. Now, two more questions. We've got Councillor McDade and Councillor Parrott, and we'll call it a day at that, I think. Thank you, Convener. Um, I obviously welcome the paper and welcome the, uh, the new vehicle activated signs that are going to be put up in uh, mine and Councillor Williamson's ward in Aberfeldy and Putlochry and where Athol and welcome the reassurance Councillor Williamson's been given relating to Strathtumble and Tumble Bridge. But my question is actually in relation to something the director said. Um, has the director been allocated any additional officer resource to implement the additional uh, revenue funding that's been granted for this year? Yeah. There was additional um, funding put uh, into the budget last year, <coughs> you know, sort of, and at that point we increased the team um, for road safety initiatives by five, I think. I was looking into the office. Yes, uh -huh. so there are there are additional staff there to be able to deal with this 
plus you know sort of the um, pedestrian crossings project as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor McDeath. Councillor Parrott. Thank you, Convener. Um, I, I, I certainly welcome these proposals for these signs. They, they, they certainly work with me. Um, the, I, my concern is that at paragraph 3.3, we're being asked to approve two lists, um, but it's only when you get to, to paragraph 2.2 .2 of, of the annex that the, the revenue allocated for them is, is, is clarified, um, it, according to my reading of the paper. And there's a sentence there, the list of works recommended to reports should fully utilize this finance. And although any underspend would facilitate additional sites to be included, um, are we saying that there's absolute certainty that the lists we're approving um, can be funded um, you know, within the resource that's allocated? In other words, the list we're approving is certain. I think the answer to the question is yes. Um, the, the reason we, we, we don't have a specific cost is that, uh, as it stands just now, until we have agreement where the signs are to go, where we're having to provide a, a power supply to these signs, we don't know what that cost will be. So as the year goes on, we'll have a better understanding as to how the, the budget is being spent. But we're, based on our previous experience, we're, we're confident that we have the funding there available to deliver the, the, the signs on this list. So, so if I may apart from one or two reassurances to particular sites that have been given during this meeting, um, this list, if you like, is finite, and any new proposals are not on the list and, and, and would have to be considered against new funding. Unless there is underspend in the current yeah. project, yes. Thanks. Okay, thank you. I'm going to move the paper. Can I have a seconder, please? Thank you. Sorry? The, I think there just was a, a couple of comments comment, people wanted to make, so we'll... We'll move the paper Quickly. and then we'll go yeah, to... This will be a quick comment. Okay, let's one. go with uh, Councillor Lane because um, he's going to be quick. Yep. Uh, it's really to say I'm glad to see we're moving away from the temporary signs. I thought that because of the way they were positioned, they never gave a true sense of you were... You would, could be doing 10 miles an hour and you were told you were speeding just because of the angle, as you said, about the microwave at the top. So I think it's really good. I, I'm look, and I welcome all the ones that are put forward and proposed. I would like to see the evidence after we've done some of the work to see if it is changing driver behaviour. I think it does the first time, the second time, the third time, but I want to see if this is continued or if we uh, driver behaviour becomes blase to them being there. So, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lane. Councillor Williamson, a comment? Uh, thank you, Convener. Yes, I think um, I am reassured by, the, by, the, the, uh, um, by what the officers have said earlier. My comment is, is around I think offices and budgets are stretched and I think really this system of, of communities coming to offices without any real idea of where the pr officers' priorities are or where the community's priorities are I is fundamentally flawed and I think uh, I would like to suggest that maybe we start looking at how we can better use the action partnerships to try start bringing forward some of their priorities within the communities and maybe invite officers to try and attend those action partnerships and better identify the, the, the priorities throughout the community, not just in individual, individual towns and villages. Thank you, Councillor Williamson. Last comment, I think, to Councillor Robertson. I, I'm really sorry, but I have to totally disagree with that. Um, my experience in, in Ward 8 in Kinrosher is that council officers have been um, very, very good indeed at responding to the request from community councils in as, in as much as even coming out and visiting members of community councils to walk around the, the ward with them to look at sites for the vehicle activated signs. I think the vehicle activated signs scheme is a great example of the council and communities working together to make um, all our towns and villages safer places for everyone to live in. So I'm sorry, I have to disagree with Councillor Williamson. I think um, the officers do a great job with the, the money that we give them for this purpose. Thank you, Councillor Robertson. And perhaps we could ask Daryl and his colleagues to take that message back to the team. Thank you. So I think we are going to move the paper, but I obviously subject to Tumble Bridge and was it Strath Allen? Strath Tumble, my apologies, I can't read my own writing. Are we happy to agree the paper? Agreed, thank you. Let's move on. Right, item eight is the active travel strategy and the new rural footways assessment criteria. Now this report outlines revised assessment criteria for new rural footways to support the prioritization of the 109 current requests for the resources available for this that have been submitted to the traffic and network team for sections of the existing network. These include 
These include where there are missing links or where better connections could be provided to help maximise the number of people who are travelling actively. The criteria is designed to prioritise these requests based on areas such as accident, casualty data, connectivity, school travel plans and alternative footways. And the committee is asked to agree the revised criteria and request a further report on the implementation of the criteria in due course. Do I have any questions? Yes. Councillor Lane. Thanks very much. Uh, I welcome this paper, Gawley, because uh, about th three or four committees ago, I asked uh, for if we had an assessment, an up-to-date assessment uh, formula, and I'm glad to see you brought it forward. I think it's very useful. Um, my first question, if you don't mind, is uh, in the heading of the report, it says the report details the assessment criteria for the list of requested rural footways and recommends the new footway schemes to be progressed. So I was wondering, which ones is it recommending? Where, where is the list of recommended roads? Yes, um, thank you for that question, Councillor Lang. That you know, sort of the the list is not within this this paper. You know, sort of this you know, sort of it should be that the new footway schemes be progressed. You know, sort of subject. So just to a typo. Yes, yeah, that, that's uh -huh. fine. Because yes. I, 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 I was looking through it for yes. days and couldn't find them. Oh dear. Well, maybe not days, but. Um, <laughs> So that's fine, it's just a table, because yes. this is a way, this is a, exactly the way it should be, and this is what should have happened with the previous papers. You come forward with the assessment criteria, we agree the assessment criteria, the officers then take the assessment criteria and place them against projects put forward. We don't have them coming forward as we did in the same paper. So I'm, I, I hope, uh, and I'm sure that you'll learn from that experience. Your comment is noted and understood. I think you had a second question, didn't you, Councillor Lee? The second question was against the uh, uh, flexibility of this budget. Um, it's, it's quite a large budget for the roads officers, who the same officers that will be doing the VAS schemes as well and will be under pressure. I was wanting to be reassured that um, where schemes are committed to, that the funding will be flexed, because uh, uh, if, if a, a, some, a, a piece of uh, pavement, etc., becomes uh, uh, identified that's worth uh, and fits the criteria, and then we have a bad winter. We're not going to have it up and running by the, the end of uh, end of March, so I, I need comfort that th the money that's allocated there will be able to be flexed over till the project's completed. Yes, we'll give you that um, reassurance, Councillor Lang. Uh, Councillor Robertson was next. Thank you. Could, I was wondering if it was possible to include, um, I'm happy with the criteria, but I was wondering if it was possible to include the involvement of board members as well in the drawing up of the of the list for award is in places like Kinrosshire there's actually other funding sources available sometimes and we've had paths put in uh, um, with the help of the council but we've actually been able to draw in money from other sources so if, we, if you actually work together with the board councillors as well as part of this as part of this process i don't know if that can be how that can be worked into this strategy but it'd be quite good um i think in the in the long run way of using resources better does that make sense to you no yeah no i, th I think if there are other opportunities to you know sort of weave it in more funding for any of the projects then we would be delighted to speak to local elected members about that um, but obviously, as we bring, you know, sort of, um, once the criteria is approved and we bring back a further report on what those, you know, sort of schemes are likely to be, then we can, you know, sort of engage the elected members in each ward on those. Thank you. Next up was Councillor Baird, followed by Councillor McDade. Thank you, Convener. My question really relates to existing footways. I note in the paper it says they can be, can be widened, but sometimes to widen these footpaths, it would actually just, if they took away all the grass and make them so there's no grass to cut at the footpaths, would, would actually, it's not the width that needs to be widened, it's just the, foot, the base of the path be made much more sustainable. So would this budget kind of help with this kind of thing? Brian, can you answer that question for us? Yeah, I think where we've said we would endeavour to, to widen the footpath is probably where we're trying to put in shared use facilities and, and by doing that we're perhaps being a bit strategic in that we can bring in external funding from outside agencies, whether that's Sustrans or Tatran. Um, so where we perhaps have a path and it perhaps falls in with a national cycle route or a green route, uh, then the, 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 the aim would be to make that a shared use path and take whatever verge or, or, or grass area um, and utilise that. 
Thank you. And Councillor McDade. Thank you, Convener. Uh, I welcome the paper and uh, the rural footways and cycle paths are uh, something I'm very strong advocate for. I am slightly concerned, and I'm just I'm just seeking reassurance really that uh, rural wards where there is perhaps land issues, but perhaps there is also accident histories, etc., will not be pushed down the list as a result of the land issues. They will still be prioritised based on need, essentially, rather than obviously ones that are green, easy to do, straight ahead, go ahead and do them. But uh, if there is important, uh, you know, accident history, etc., that that will still be progressed, even if there are other issues surrounding it. Brian, can you take that one, please? Yeah, you're absolutely correct. Um, as soon as we encounter land issues, that puts delays on to, to that project. But until we arrive at the, the, the list having been prioritised, we, we don't really know where we are yet with that. If there are projects that have land uh, requirements, we, we, we have said that, that that wouldn't be to the, the detriment of them featuring higher up the list. In year one, we can start the process, perhaps with our estates colleagues, to, to enter into the discussions with the landowner, with the hope being that in year two we can deliver that project. So it, it, it wouldn't discount it purely because there's a land issue. Yep. Councillor Parrott. Thank you, Convener. It, it's nice to see uh, this proposal a, as a ranking criteria brought forward. M my only concern is that para 2.2, that... Um, Given the attention that any fatalities on the road and network attract, is, is a, a grading of three points for fatality um, really reflective of, of the import of that? And, and, and should actually that three points be four or five? Thank you. Someone from road safety here? Yeah, the, it's always a difficult uh, subject when we have a fatality on the road network, um, but until we receive the report from Police Scotland um, and, and we're fully uh, um, abreast of all the facts, it won't necessarily be the case. It could well be driver error. Um, so the, when we have the facts, we'll pull all that together. So the scoring of, of three for a fatality is really just arrive at a score at the end of the day. Um, we could increase that score and it kind of uh, slews the, uh, the impression that that's a, a, a site that we should be tackling before another site. Um, but it may be that the reason for that fatality, it wouldn't have mattered whether we had a footpath or not there. I would th th thanks for that. I, I was making the assumption, if you like, that um, the awarding of the points was based on analysis that demonstrated that it was sensible to include those points. And, and, and if that was the case, um, three points for fatality um, against the assessment table, you know, example where you're getting eight and six, um, it, it still seems to me to be rather low. But it's obviously been thought through. Barbara's going to answer that. Um, thank you for um, that question, Councillor Parrott. If um, Chick was here, we had when we discussed this paper, you know, sort of our reports meeting internally then you know, sort of one of the issues is that there is no particular accident hotspot now in any part of Perth and Kinross. And I think that the, you know, sort of the point scoring for that was reflective of that. Um, obviously, you know, sort of in terms of the, 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 the degree of um, category of casualty is then picked up a little bit in the next criteria, which is about who is actually injured in that. So there are actually more points for, for casualties as well built in because we've got the collision and casualty data and the seriousness of that, and then who is affected by that that, uh, that casualty as well. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Councillor McDade. Yeah, just to pick up on that point by Councillor uh, Parrott and the director, um, the five year, the five calendar years um, is slightly concerning to me because, for example, I know of somewhere in my ward where there was a fatal accident of a child, um, and that is still that area is still there. There's nothing being changed about it, uh, and therefore the, the issue still exists essentially, but it might not actually be counted within your statistics because it's not within the last five years. It was within the last 10, for example. So is there a bit of flexibility around that, knowing that you know we hope fatalities are few and far between, but when they do happen, if the issues maybe not had the opportunity to be sorted due funding or whatever other issues within that first five years, they may still exist, but you know we might need to go further back for the information. Darrell, can you answer that? Yeah, 
<coughs> the national guidance for assessing casualty cluster sites uh, is looking at three years. You're looking at an average of you know, uh, three, year, three ca collisions and three casualties within a three year period. Because we're in the fortunate position in Perth and Kinross Council that both the number of collisions and the number of casualties is relatively low, we're taking the decision to extend that to cover a five year period. We do have data that goes back much longer than that, and we can look at historic data if we feel that it is relevant to the case. And if the councillor wants us to, you know, to include that, we, we can do so. It, I mean, if there is a, a collision that has taken place and it's been the only incident that has happened or within you know, a 10 year period, it, there's, there's no pattern there. It's, it's a one off. So again, we need to go back and do the analysis to see whether the circumstances are relevant. But if, if it is the committee's decision, we can look at a longer assessment period. Are you happy with that answer, Councillor McDeef? Thank you. Do we have any more questions? I'm happy to move the paper. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Baird seconded. Thank you. Are there any comments on the paper? Okay. We shall move on to item nine then. Oh, sorry, my apologies have been kept right. Do we agree the paper? Agree. Thank you. Right, item nine, active travel strategy again. I'm happy just to move this report. I assume everyone's read it. Do you have any questions for me or for the staff? Go with Councillor Waters, followed by Councillor Dugan. Thank, thank you. Thank you, convener. Uh, having, be, having been um, quite heavily involved with uh, the, the street audit and um, for people with uh, mobility issues around Kinrossia. Um, uh, first of all, a thank you to the, the officers, uh, people at Inclusive Living, uh, who done it. But I noticed uh, there was just £9,000 put aside for qu what was quite a lot of issues that people were having around the town. And m my concern is how far will that go? Can officers give some reassurance on that, the, 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 you know, what, what areas are will be prioritised and how far that, that amount of money will go. Thank you. Brian, you please answer that. Yes. Um, the, the street audit process that we carried out with the Centre for Inclusive Living and Vision PK and the various communities was a, f from a, 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 an engineer's point of view, was a fantastic experience. We gained a, a great insight into the issues that the vulnerable road user and pedestrian has on a daily basis. So. Um, what we've tried to do, we, uh, the initial surveys that we carried out were in Perth City, Blairgowrie and Creef, and we endeavoured to deliver some of the measures in these areas. There's an, there is an overspill that we're trying to finish off some of these areas this calendar year, but we kept the audits going and we've now progressed into many other areas and what we're trying to do is to deliver something in these areas. That £9,000 will not finish the issues that were, were identified. Um, but what we then do, again, as engineers, we're, we're perhaps qualified technically, but we're not necessarily qualified uh, with, with the ability to assess what should and shouldn't be done. Um, so this is where Centre for Inclusive Living have come in, and they'll tell us what their priorities are and what they say would be the main benefit to the vulnerable users in these various communities. And that's where we'll target that £9,000 first. Once we've completed that and spent the £9,000, we would be looking to come back to committee next year or if additional funding is made available, we can endeavour to, to address more measures. But you're, you're absolutely right, £9,000 isn't a lot of money, but we're trying to spread it across several boroughs. Supplementary? So, 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 so the £9,000 will just get the, 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 the Living Street report that, that's come out, the, the £9,000 will just cover a small part of that. And then, and then, and then, in subsequent years, we, we will have to come back to get more to finish off, finish off the work. Um, subject to funding, um, we, we would be going back to, to do what we, we still had to do. Nine thousand pounds, for example, a, a set of drop curbs probably cost maybe twelve hundred to fifteen hundred pounds. So that maybe gives you a feel for what you can do with nine thousand pounds. It doesn't go far, um, and that's why we need the Centre for Inclusive Living to say well, what is the best area and what is the best measures to, 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 to spend this £9,000 on? Thank you, Councillor Dugan was next, followed by Councillor Jarvis. Thank you, Convener. Just the cycling element of this, um, I, I, I'm not sure if it's appropriate. I'm happy for officers to correct me, but uh, one of the key uh, projects that's underway in Perth and Kinross is the Strathmore Cycle Network. Um, and uh, 
I don't see any reference to this at all. It might be because it's not appropriate, but in the event that it's not, could I get a feeling for the uh, support that the council has for that project? Brian, again, please. Um, the Strathmore Cycle Network, um, over the last couple of years, we've, we've done a, a lot of work. We've, we've created a number of green routes, um, and we've also provided directional signing. So from the green routes point of view, we've brought the, the speed limit down from the national 60 down to 40 or 30 where appropriate. Um, that's been well received by the communities. Um, we have had extensive and ongoing discussions with the, the Strathmore, Strathmore Cycle Network group, um, where we're, we're, we're actively looking at a project between Cuprangus and Buergauri um, that we're hoping to work together on in the coming years. So the commitment is definitely there from the, the Council's point of view uh, and we'll continue to, to, to deal with requests in that area as well as, as any other areas that come in. So there is a commitment there. Very reassuring, thank you. Barbara's going to come in on that as yeah. well. Um, it's not often I get out and about, but I've also been to meet the group, you know, sort of, um, you know, sort of, highly welcoming the work that we're doing within that area and the aspirations that we would want to be supporting. I think over and above the the um, healthy living and all the rest of it, it must uh, represent one of the most successful inter-community cooperations that we've got in Perth and Kinross. We could be using it as a template, hopefully. Thank you, Councillor Dugan. Councillor Jarvis. Okay, thank you. Um, it's item 17 on page 61, Castle Bray. Uh, this is a... a be very welcomed by the parent council and, and the head teacher at the, s the school because uh, the big concern is the you know they need this footpath because otherwise the children are walking on the roadway with cars so i wondered first of all if there's any scope for maybe extending it some somehow uh, and the other thing is it's listed as being in ward 11 it should actually be ward 5. thank you for that council jarvis can someone answer that, please? Um, we, we are clearly going to have to get an up-to-date board map. <laughs> it was just to make sure you were reading the papers. That's why we put that in. Um, we, what we would say is, um, obviously, hopefully, we, we get the approval from committee today to move forward with these projects. And at that point, we're happy to, to discuss with, with yourself or any other groups as to what we would propose to do and what you would like us to do. So we're more than happy to meet following the meeting. We'll do that. Delighted. Do we have any more questions? Okay, I'm happy to move the paper. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Jarvis, thank you. Do we have any comments? Thanks, convener. Yes, uh, like Anne, I totally welcome this. I would be quite happy to delegate uh, Huntington Tower to Ward uh, 11 if they're willing to take uh, all associated problems with the Ammon Bank flood mitigation scheme on board as well. Thank you, Councillor Lane. Do we have any other comments on the paper? No, nope, good, we'll move on then to, <laughs> I agreed, sorry, thank you. <laughs> We're all agreed, good. The Community Challenge Fund, I'm sure everyone's read the paper. Okay, item 10. Happy to take any questions on item 10. Okay. Any comments? Yeah. We don't have a seconder. Do we have a seconder for item 10? You <laughs> 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 don't need, oh sorry, right, okay. Right, item 10. I think, do we comment on it? Sorry, I'm happy to take comments on it. <laughs> I, I, well, I think it's, uh, it's worthwhile comment on. The, the, the funding that's coming out of these uh, these funds is, is, is very welcome within the community. What the one here is uh, the Stanley Development Trust through sewers, etc., are hoping to bring back, uh, reinstate a football pitch in Stanley. It's really, I know that it's reached the end of the day, but we shouldn't dismiss this. There's a lot of good stuff coming out of these funds that are available, and with the officers, etc., helping uh, groups to, to find, <coughs> find the funding, I think it, there's serious amounts of money there. So I just wanted to make a point that is. Uh, uh, appreciated the work that the officers are doing with groups and pointing towards funding which is using the communities. We ended up, we spent uh, about an hour talking about 15 or 30,000. There's a lot more coming out here to communities than was going to that one project so I think it's worth uh, getting, uh, being afforded the respect it deserves. Thank you Councillor Ling. Do we have any other comments on this paper? Councillor Baird. Uh, 
A very quick comment. I just note that this money is being spread throughout Perth and Kinross Ward. It's not just sticking to one area, so it's good that every ward you can get some money this year. I think uh, Barbara's going to respond to one of the comments? No, I think it's just, you know, sort of the, the work that our communities do, you know, sort of supported by your staff, I think is invaluable. I think that when you look at how far the £100,000 goes, you know, sort of it is really re remarkable, but how much other funding that community groups can re to generate into that. One of the things for me, though, is about seeing how far we can take that as well, and so that the suggestion through using, you know, sort of um, the, the, our waste, you know, sort of um, contractor and, you know, those arrangements as well, I think would just add to the project as well. So I'd like to pass my thanks on to the staff that have been doing and the communities that have been working there as well. Thank you, Barbara. So we're agreed the paper. I'm just wondering what the committee's view is on items 11 through to items 20. Um, if we were to agree them all as one, would people be comfortable with that or would we go through them one by one? I'm open to anyone's views on that. Councillor Jarvis. Well, I'm happy to agree to them all, but I would like to make a comment on 17. Thank you, we can come back to that. Okay, just for the record, can we agree everything through to 20 in one go? So we've got a seconder from Councillor Ahern, and Councillor Jarvis wants to make a comment. Yes, I just want to uh, say thank you to the officers because when the money D speed limit was raised, there was very prompt reaction. They were on site, I think, almost within a week. And this, of course, has progressed, and this has all been very quickly done as well. So thanks to them. Thank you for that. Do we have any other comments on any of these items? Good. Well, thank you very much, everyone. That's the end of the meeting.